Zoom, but I'm sure you can figure, you, you know how to do it. Um, yeah. And second, Shun Ho, um, is there anything in particular uh, you'd like me to introduce about Not you? really, not really. Just a short introduction. Uh, second, Shun, Shun Ho, okay. um, is there anything in particular uh, you'd like me to introduce about you? Not really, not really. Just a short introduction. Uh, second, Shun Ho. So I was getting a recording of everything I was saying and Chuan Ho was saying. Yeah, that was because we turned on the, uh, our- YouTube yeah. live. Yeah, <laughs> it should be fine now. Yeah. Okay, so now we're okay? Yeah. We're not live, I hope. We're live. Oh dear. Okay, uh, Dave, just a very short name and title will be fine, totally fine. Uh, I just pulled up your CV. Um, so you were a postdoc at Dave Mooney and then you were a professor at Duke, right? Yeah. For four years? Around and then, uh, and then uh, MIT stole you. <laughs> I guess I still miss Boston, yeah. Yeah, I don't blame you. Not Boston area, yeah. And so would you describe your work mainly as the uh, uh, interface between uh, humans and machines or as uh, trying to do uh, translational work for uh, using soft materials? Uh, I would say uh, both, both are fundamentals in terms of understanding properties. Uh, and then uh, we're doing some translational works uh, using soft materials on this interface. Okay. But yeah, do you think you're so, interested? Uh, sorry, really sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but uh, one participant mentioned that your voice is on the uh, low side, so speak loudly. Oh, sure, sure. How about now? Is this better? Yeah, good. Sure. That won't be a problem. <laughs> I'll speak loudly. Now, uh, turn, uh, Jigang, how did you come up with this idea? <laughs> I remember uh, a student mentioned that's the highlight of uh, his uh, week or, you know, during the pandemic. This is really the highlight of uh, every week, uh, you know, of my <laughs> academic life. I truly- well, Probably at, at, when, you, you, when you are staying at home for long enough, you really have to think. <laughs> Something fun. Jigong, go ahead. Yeah. So I got an invitation to give a webinar from uh, China, from uh, Yujie. So I didn't know how to work. And, uh, and I give my webinar, it actually worked fine. So then I uh, asked whether Hutchinson wants to be give a webinar. Then I thought my duty of EML. So these two, Hutchinson and E.L. Mel, they were born together. So that's that. Hmm. Once we start, um, Shigong, will yeah. you mute everybody except for uh, Shuan He? Uh, so everybody is uh, muted. So you can choose to mute yourself. Okay, all right. So I can just do, I, I'll mute myself then once we start. Yeah. Okay, and, uh, right. no problem. And then for questions, um, would you uh, take them? Yeah, uh, so what I will do is a turn and I uh, will uh, promote whoever have a question on the screen. And at the end, you will see the whole screen, people are available and they can raise their hand, then you just call on people. Do, but should I do that or will you do that? You do that. Okay, and will, uh, I, I know on my screen, it, it, the, the last I remember, there were hundreds of people uh -huh. and I can only see maybe 20 on my screen. Yeah. Oh, that's because, uh, mm -hmm. interesting. So we have uh, still increasing 300, still climbing. 
Yeah, I mean, I know I can scroll through them, but I'm not going to be able to scroll through yeah. 300. Yeah, Dave, you don't need to worry about it. You only look at the screen, and okay. then you will see about 20 people. And I just ask questions from those. Yeah. And okay. Dave, sometimes uh, people do leave uh, questions in the Q&A button. If you see the Q&A button, yeah. uh, whoever raised a question, you will see over there. Um, and, 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 and do we ask them, or do I read the question? Uh, so sometimes uh, Jigang and I, we uh, and also other panelists, uh, you can help answer those questions in by typing in the answers. If uh, it's an open question for Xun He uh, and it's suitable later on in the Q and the session, uh, we can or you can uh, you can read those and answer the questions to Xun He. Okay. Yeah. So, Shanghe, we have a few more minutes. Now, so one aspect always fascinated me um, is that you were an electrical engineering student, uh, undergraduate, right? Tianjin University, is that right? Hey, Shanghe. Hmm. Uh, Jiga. I yeah. didn't hear your last question, sorry. Oh. My internet is unstable. Your last question, I didn't hear it. Oh, okay. Um, you were undergraduate, uh, your undergraduate uh, major was um, electrical engineering. Yes. Right. And then uh, you, uh, you applied to me, want to be a PhD student in mechanics. How did that happen? I never asked that question to you. <laughs> I, I, I actually, uh, you know, well, long story short, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, electrical engineer, we study uh, electrical materials, especially we use uh, a finite element to uh, simulate, uh, you know, uh, for example, dielectric constants of uh, uh, materials. And then at that time, uh, Jigang is uh, studying, you know, electron migration, all these fascinating problems. So I contact you, Jigal. That's uh, the short answer. Uh, the long answer is uh, actually uh, later I will tell you. I actually contact you multiple times. Yes. When I was an undergraduate student and then later master student, uh, eventually uh, I get in. So for all students who want to join uh, Jigal's group, you know, contact Jigal multiple times. Try multiple times. Everybody tries to contact Jigal. Yeah, no, it's a. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a smoke between I'm, you and uh, uh, and uh, Shanghe. Maybe we should get started uh, sure. in a minute. Sure. Um, right. So uh, we don't need to wait because everything is uh, recorded. If people miss some part, they can always go for uh, on YouTube uh, to take a look. Sure. Sure. Right. Shanghe, hopefully your internet uh, at home is uh, stable today. It should be. I uh, I give uh, lectures classes twice a week, so okay. it never. Uh, so it should be. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Another thing we can do as panelists, though, once Shanghe start, uh, we can uh, shut the our live video. So. Yeah. To save bandwidth. Um, Shanghe, why don't you get started? Sure. Should I introduce him? Oh, or? yes, please. Sure. Go ahead. Dave. Okay, so um, for everyone who's listening, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Shanghe Zhao. Uh, I'm Dave Waits from Harvard. Uh, and just a little bit about Shanghe. He was, I just learned, an uh, electrical engineering uh, student at Tianjin. Uh, and he contacted uh, Zhigang Shuo uh, many times and finally became, uh, very luckily, a graduate student and postdoc at Harvard, where he was both a graduate student and a postdoc in only four years. He then was a professor at Duke uh, and moved to MIT a few years ago. Uh, he's an expert in soft materials. He's interested in the fundamentals of soft materials, but also in their applications, both to the man-machine interface and for translational medicine. And it's really both a pleasure and an honor to be able to introduce him. And Shanghe, the floor is all yours, or the screen is yours. 
Thank you so much, Dave. It's a great honor uh, to give this uh, uh, seminar, especially after uh, Professor Hutchinson, Professor Rogers, and uh, Professor Gao. And it's a great honor to have uh, Professor Weiss as my host. Uh, I actually learned some uh, very fundamental experiment techniques in soft material uh, from Professor Weiss' lab. And then uh, I made many good friends there. So they're still uh, good friends over uh, throughout my career. So today I'll talk about uh, extreme mechanics of uh, soft materials for merging human machine interface. Xian Hazal from MIT. This is my group website. If you want to know more information, uh, feel free to go there. Uh, so merging humans and machines. Uh, the opportunity we see is this gap. Over the last century, we see great progress in terms of understanding and engineering human body, all the way from modern medicine, biology, uh, genetics, this list goes long. Uh, similarly, in the domain of uh, machines, we see the great advance of electronics, computer, internet, AI, robotics. Again, this list uh, goes long. However, this interface between humans and machines are extremely weak. Human body is still human body, machines are still machines. What if we can merge them together, merging humans and machines? Impact number one, uh, better health. That's something we all want. Uh, however, if you think about all the way from wearable devices, medical equipment, medical implants, uh, these are machines merging with the human body across a few hours, a few days, to a few months and years, right? Uh, nowadays, we are developing more and more sophisticated machines. Uh, however, this interface between the machine and the human body are still almost the same as uh, you know decades ago. Uh, grand challenges in this field, how to detect COVID-19 contraction in real time, how to continuous measure glucose level, blood pressure over months, how to alleviate foreign body responses to artificial organs. These are the challenges can potentially change the landscape of our healthcare system. Even the society nowadays, especially under this COVID-19 situation. Right? Uh, however, this uh, extremely weak interface between human bodies and machines are really delaying the merging between human and machines. Uh, second, understand the brain, right? Uh, this, we have three billion base pairs of uh, DNA in the human genome. Uh, it's readily sequenced as a material uh, within a day with uh, less than $200 nowadays. Uh, similarly, how to interface with even 1 million neurons in a living brain? This is still a grand challenge in science and technology. Uh, the state of art is uh, around 3,000 neurons uh, by neural length, right? But how to interface even with a million neurons? Nowadays, we are developing more and more powerful supercomputers. However, the interface between those computers and the human brain are extremely weak. Uh, can we address that challenge uh, to really better understand the brain? Uh, now, further impact, if we think further, if we can truly merge human intelligence and the machine intelligence, uh, does it mean super intelligence, right? If we can change our mind from one avatar to another avatar, does it mean immortality? If we can create a real VR world, can we really be the god of this VR world, right? Uh, extend human capability. Many, many exciting uh, possibilities uh, by merging humans and the machines. Uh, what are the challenges? Right? The fundamental properties of uh, human bodies and machines. Human body are soft, white, living. On the other hand, machines are intrinsically hard, dry, non-living. Most of them are inorganic, right? This dramatic, different material properties actually pose grand challenges in mechanics, materials, and biology. Now, let's take a closer look at different components of human body, right? Here, we plot different components of human body as a function of their rigidity. Uh, you can see all the way from a fat to tendon, uh, they are soft materials, except teeth, bone, and the nails. All other components of human body are soft materials. Their rigidity is on the order of one kilopascal to 10 megapascal. They are not only soft, they are white. They contain 70 to 90% water. They are also living. They can grow. They can sense, respond, self-heal. They are also robust. Under millions of cycles of loads, uh, they are still maintain the integrity and the well-being over a lifetime, right? Uh, now, with this understanding, 
uh, we propose the concept of a soft material technology. This is a strategy. Uh, the idea is since the major component of human body are soft materials, let's design soft materials with similar mechanical and the physiological properties as different components of human body. And the biological study already show that uh, those soft materials can maintain long-term high efficacy interface with human body with minimal foreign body response. At the same time, uh, let's embed uh, external machines such as computer chips, sensors, actuators, even robots uh, into those soft material matrix, eventually potentially forming this merging between humans and uh, machines. Right? Uh, I want to emphasize uh, one point. Uh, we are not using soft materials to design new machines. For example, uh, with these computer chips, we will uh, never uh, use soft materials to design a new computer chip. Right? The current IC technology already very advanced. We want to harness such technology, but we want to design this new interface so that we can better merge human and the machines. In order to design such soft material interface technology, of course, uh, we need to rely on decades of uh, fundamental research in terms of polymer physics and the polymer chemistry. Uh, but not only that, uh, we also need some design, some, uh, I would say, extreme properties of soft materials. Uh, for example, this piece of jello, right? Uh, we want to design this to be part of human body so that it can compatibly merge with human body at the same time part of the machine, so it can behave as this a bridge between human and machine. Uh, then we need a design to be tough, not only soft, need to be also tough, resilient, fatigue resistant, under multiple cycles of load, adhesive to both human body and the external machines, also active. Uh, sometimes we want this interface to stimulate, to interact with the body. Uh, these are the properties that has not been well studied by pioneers of this field. And that's the opportunity we see in terms of a fundamental understanding and the design of this extreme mechanics of soft materials. Uh, one fundamental question we are asking is, besides entropic effects that have been well studied, what is the energy required to fracture amorphous polymer chains, nanocrystalline domains, nanofibers. So this is highly nonlinear and the non-equilibrium process, but uh, they has not been well studied, but critically important for extreme mechanics of soft materials. Uh, now, today I will talk about uh, a few examples of uh, studying fundamental mechanics of soft materials, but I will study them with examples in the uh, world of uh, soft materials. The first one is adhesion, right? A long-term mechanics uh, problem. Uh, the example I want to use is bioadhesives to replace sutures or motivation. Uh, there are over 200 million major surgeries each year. Most of them require suturing for wound closure. Uh, however, we know suturing is a damaging process, right? It causes tissue damage, pain, scar, infection, leakage. And if this leakage is uh, in the inner organ, it can be even fatal scenario, right? Suturing is also, uh, you know, long lasting uh, technology, ancient technology, right? You can see over thousands of years, uh, people has been developing and improving suturing technology. And only at the beginning of this century, right? People are trying to invent bioadhesives or adhesives, use adhesion to replace sutures. Uh, but existing tissue adhesives face many challenges, right? Uh, the first one, weak and brittle, I'll address, uh, I'll discuss our works in addressing these uh, challenges uh, one by one. Right? Uh, the existing toughness of uh, existing uh, bioadhesive tissue adhesives is on the order of one to 10 joule per meter square. I'll tell you the meaning of this number uh, just shortly. Right? Uh, now, let me tell you the reason uh, why uh, previous works, uh, the uh, adhesion energy are uh, weak. Uh, previous work has been focused on the interfacial chemistry, right? I use this uh, review paper as an example, right? People develop different uh, uh, chemistry to bond bioadhesive or a material matrix uh, to these issues. There are many uh, available chemistry. And I also apologize since there are many, many works in this field. Uh, if I didn't discuss uh, uh, the pioneer's work, I apologize here. Uh, but I want to discuss uh, the uh, uh, the, the one thing has been neglected by the field for a while. 
uh, which is the uh, matrix, right? Uh, you can design whatever uh, you know interfacial uh, chemistry. However, from this video, you see the challenge with the matrix. If the matrix by itself is weak and brittle, uh, the damage or the crack can tilt into the matrix. Then this cohesive failure give you an upper boundary for the adhesion energy of bioadhesives on materials, on tissues. So there is an intrinsic upper boundary if a cohesive failure occurs. Right. Uh, the state of art as of uh, 2014, so uh, this uh, milestone paper published in 2014 uh, in achieved interfacial toughness around the 20 joule per meter square. And they also summarize many previous works. Uh, that's the state of art. They use uh, nanoparticle solutions as adhesives for gels and biological tissues. Uh, now in 2015, uh, we actually uh, changed, I would say the landscape in this uh, field of uh, bioadhesives or soft uh, white adhesion. Right? Uh, we design hydrogels with 90% water that can adhere on silicon, silicon dioxide, glass, ceramic, different types of metals, elastomers, other hydrogels, achieving interfacial energy toughness over a thousand joule per square. Uh, this is the video of a tea peeling test you can see, if I do not tell you this is a hydrogel, you may think this is an industrial glue, extremely tough and the strong adhesion of this hydrogel on the substrate material, diverse substrate materials, right? Uh, now, let me tell you the mechanism. Uh, the reason we uh, can achieve this, uh, you know, orders of magnitude higher uh, uh, interfacial toughness is due to the uh, new mechanism. Uh, there are three key points in the mechanism. Number one, tough bioadhesive first require tough hydrogel matrix, right? First design your matrix before you design the interface. Uh, therefore, tough hydrogel, uh, in summarizing one sentence, build dissipation into stretchy network. It's similar to toughening metals or other materials. You need the material to be dissipated. You, you also need uh, some stretchability, some uh, deformability of the material. Uh, if you want to know more about this field, uh, take a look at this uh, review paper. We summarize many pioneer works in this uh, field. Uh, then once we understand these two points for tough adhesion, it becomes simpler. Uh, we need integrate bulk dis uh, in dissipation and the interfacial, strong interfacial linkage, right? As in this uh, uh, figure, you need uh, this uh, strong interfacial linkage anchor your gel matrix on the substrate material. Uh, then the dissipation kick in, a summation of the contribution of the interfacial linkage and the dissipation give an extremely high interfacial toughness. So that's the uh, qualitative understanding of this uh, mechanism. Uh, we also develop quantitative uh, models. Uh, so here is one, you can see, uh, this is a simulation of this uh, peeling process, uh, match each other very well. And then in this simulation in particular, uh, we indicate the dissipation. You can see these colors indicate the red fluid scale of dissipation from the bulk and then a synergy of this bulk dissipation plus interfacial linkage give you extremely high uh, interfacial toughness. Uh, also, we even summarize those results into one simple scaling equation. I will not discuss the details of this, uh, but if you're interested, you can take a look at these papers uh, for the details of this view. Uh, then after uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, extremely tough and a strong bonding of hydrogels or bioadhesives to other materials, uh, is not a challenge for this field anymore, right? Uh, there has been uh, hundreds of papers in this field uh, nowadays now uh, addressing different aspects of this uh, problem. Uh, we did one follow-up work. We even make some uh, societal impact. Uh, so in particular, uh, we uh, fabricate this uh, tough uh, hydrogel elastomer hybrid. Uh, especially, uh, we make this uh, elastomer to be a uh, external layer of the hydrogel so that uh, the elastomer can lock the water inside uh, the hydrogel. So it's anti-dehydration hydrogel. We published this paper in 2016. Uh, a tissue phantom company, CRRS, uh, noticed our, our paper. They license it right away and then they make it into products in 2017, right? Uh, this is tissue phantom, right? The first generation, previous generation of tissue phantom are based on very soft, uh, you know, rubber, right? They have the similar level of rigidity as human tissues, but they do not contain water. So it does not give a realistic medical image. Uh, then 
Uh, for the next generation, people try to develop a hydrogel-based tissue phantom, but since hydrogel contains a large amount of water, they dry up too quickly. And people try to develop this, uh, you know, uh, coatings for hydrogels uh, for anti-dehydration. Now they are using our technology to strongly bond the elastomer skin and the hydrogels together into this uh, robust and uh, long-lasting tissue phantom. And uh, nowadays, this tissue phantom has been widely used uh, in uh, many hospitals across US for training doctors on ultrasound, X-ray, CT, MRI. Uh, in turn, those doctors will help patients, uh, especially you know, at this COVID-19 situation, right? Imaging is a very important technology. So we are glad that uh, even though we just published this paper in 2016, it's already made some societal impact uh, in this circle by new technology, by new understanding of uh, mechanics. Uh, I will now discuss uh, further along this uh, direction, uh, but uh, to uh, address the second challenge, right? Uh, slow. Uh, weak and brittle is a uh, thermodynamic. Uh, slow is kinetics, right? How to address this uh, challenge? Let's go back to the fundamentals, right? Previous ballot adhesive has been based on diffusion of polymers towards tissues to form adhesion, right? Uh, tissues, especially tissues of internal tissues and organs, they are covered by a layer of interfacial water, right? Uh, then uh, for existing bioadhesives, in order to form the adhesion of this uh, adhesive molecules to the tissues, uh, they diffuse this uh, adhesive molecule across this interfacial water and to form the adhesion with the tissues. This strategy works, so it works. Uh, however, here is the challenge. If we have a single monomer, the time scale for diffusing this monomer across the water layer is the water layer length scale square divided by the diffusivity of the monomer. This is number is fast. It can be within a few seconds. Uh, however, if you connect this monomer into a long chain polymer, then here the diffusivity is the diffusivity of this uh, long chain uh, polymer. Uh, then you need a multiple this uh, 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 time scale for monomer with the degree of polymerization. N number is usually thousands to millions. Uh, then even though T monomer is on the order of a second, this, uh, the, the uh, adhesion time for long chain polymers is on the order of a minute, five to 30 minutes to form stable adhesion on white tissues. However, in surgery room, uh, we need less than a few seconds, right? Doctors do not have time to hold the tissue together, right? If you need a five to 30 minutes, uh, there is not too much hope you can replace very uh, you know, developed uh, suturing uh, technology. Uh, in 2019, uh, we proposed another new mechanism to address this issue. Instead of you know, incrementally uh, you know, uh, address this problem, we propose a dramatically different mechanism. The idea is here. Uh, we propose a dry cross-linked polymer network. This is not a, you know, a polymer chains anymore. This is a, a polymer network, it's in dry state. Uh, then instead of diffusing polymer chains across this water layer, now water will diffuse into this uh, polymer network. That can be very fast because water are small molecules. That time can be very fast. At the same time, as water diffuse into this polymer network, the network swell up and then simultaneously it form very fast reversible bond and a strong covalent bond with tissue. Then you form this strong adhesion at the interface. Uh, at the same time, this bulk matrix turn into a tough hydrogel matrix we just discussed in the previous part. You achieve integrate all these uh, gradients together. And there is a, also a byproduct benefit. Now we have a double side tape form factor of uh, tissue adhesives, right? Uh, we interviewed many doctors, surgeons. They would really prefer a double side tape to handle tissues, to glue tissues together, instead of spreading, uh, you know, uh, liquid uh, glues, right? Uh, so you can see this is a double side tape. You can make it into different forms. And once it turns into a hydrogel, become very soft and stretchable. Uh, this can match the rigidity of different tissues that you adhere this double side tape. Uh, we further develop uh, quantitative models. Uh, it turns out this uh, physical process of this uh, double-sided tape, the mechanism is uh, quite interesting. 
It's a coupled hydration and uh, diffusion swelling process. Basically, water will first hydrate uh, the surface layer, the top layer of this double side tape. Uh, and then you have a sharp hydration front. This hydration front will advance in the double side tape. Uh, gradually, the hydrated part become a gel and then they swell. Uh, they touch the tissue and then form a cross linking, uh, form this uh, adhesive. Uh, uh, this is the model. We develop a coupled hydration swelling model. The hydration follows case one hydration. Uh, the hydration front location scale with the square root of time. Uh, swelling follows this uh, typical diffusion based uh, swelling. And then by solving this uh, coupled equation, uh, now we have a master curve that can predict in order to absorb certain amount of interfacial water, what's the tape thickness we need uh, within a certain time amount. Uh, for example, in order to absorb a water layer of 10 micrometer, uh, within five seconds, we only need a double side tape of 2.1 micrometer. Right? Then with this uh, governing curve, we map different tissues of organs of the body onto this curve. Now we can customize the design double side tape for different parts of the body. Uh, let's take a look at the experimental results. So here is a sashimi plate, right? Uh, different porcelain uh, organs. This is an ex vivo test. Uh, now this is a piece of tendon, two pieces of tendon. You adhere them together within five uh, seconds, uh, gentle pressure, five seconds, they form very strong adhesion. And then this is a T-peeling test. You can see, Eventually, you peel off fibers from the tendon, but the adhesion still maintain, uh, you know, uh, intact. Uh, muscles or different other organs, you can adhere them uh, within five seconds. Now, let me summary. Uh, skin, tendon, stomach, muscle, heart, liver, these are tissue to tissue adhesion, hydrogels to tissues, silicon, titanium, PDMS, polyimide, polycarbonate, these are device material. Now with this uh, double side tape technology, within five seconds, we can adhere different tissues, different device together with gentle pressure of five seconds. Performance wise, uh, this paper actually uh, summarized the uh, performance in terms of interfacial toughness, uh, shear and the tensile uh, strength, of uh, existing commercially available tissue adhesives. We also repeat those results. Uh, the results are on a similar level. Uh, this is the performance of our work. You can see uh, multiple times of uh, enhancement, even order of the magnitude of enhancement. And this is even more important. Existing one usually take over one minute to form the adhesion. Uh, it only takes a double set tape five seconds uh, to form high stress, long-term stable adhesion. Right? Uh, now I will show some uh, uh, animal test with blood. So if you're allergic to blood, uh, you can uh, turn around for just a few minutes, then uh, you can turn back. Uh, what can be the impact? So this is one, after heart attack, it's highly desirable to adhere a drug patch to the infected region of the heart, right? Uh, however, existing technology will rely on suturing, uh, suture the heart patch to the heart then you cause more tissue damage of the heart. Uh, now with our technology, we can adhere a drug patch on a beating heart within five seconds. You can see, uh, this is just my graduate student. We don't even need a very experienced surgeon uh, to adhere this on beating heart. And the, the uh, drug patch lasts for days, highly reproducible process. And in addition, because we don't need a suture anymore, uh, we can even export potential minimal invasive operation. So no need to open chest surgery anymore. After heart attack, do a simple minimal invasive operation. You can adhere this drug patch uh, to the infected region of the heart. So potential impact uh, multiple hundreds of thousands of people, even just in US. Uh, another one, devices, right? Uh, we discussed the wearable devices. Actually, there are a number of implanted devices uh, nowadays, almost all implanted devices require suture. If you want to, you know, uh, fix the device on certain region of the body, you need to suture it on. Uh, now, with our uh, double-sided tape technology, uh, we can literally adhere electrode 
uh, adhere other devices onto uh, you know, white dynamic organs and tissues of the body. In terms of performance, you can see this is epicardia ECG. This is a skin ECG, right? A much better signal from this epicardia ECG signal. Also, in the last four days, right, 14 days, maintain the same conductivity, maintain the same impedance, interfacial toughness. So potentially, this can give you a long-term strategy for integrating devices uh, to the body, adhering devices uh, to white dynamic tissues and organs. Uh, the next one will be the, but the most bloody video. So hemorrhage, severe bleeding scenario. One of the most severe bleeding scenario is a poke a hole on the heart. Here in this experiment, uh, we poke a hole on a living right heart. You can see uh, if uh, this uh, hole is not sealed, uh, within a second, this animal will die. Uh, however, with our technology, uh, you can see this is a before puncture, after puncture, the blood pressure of this animal dropped by 50%. Uh, this, if this lasts for a few seconds, uh, this animal will die. But uh, our uh, double side tape technology seal this hole right away within five seconds. Then after that, this animal recovered a normal blood pressure level. And the animal survives, so uh, maintain, you know, uh, survive for weeks, even months. Uh, some other potential impact, uh, lung surgery, right? After this uh, COVID situation, lung and the trachea surgery will become more and more important. Our, there are challenges in those surgery. The surgical closure of defects in the airway lung by sutures and staples is limited by 30% failure rate. So sutures fail often. We need an alternative treatment. These are a quotes uh, from our collaborators at Harvard Medical School. Right? Now one alternative treatment is using this kind of uh, uh, double side tape technology. Uh, literally you use a patch to seal those uh, suturing points. You also, you can use this patch to reinforce the suturing points. Many, many possibilities. Uh, another example, sealing anesthetic leakage after surgery. Anesthetic leakage after colorectal surgery can be fatal. We need a better seal, like a duct tape. Again, quotes from our collaborators. There are many uh, thousands of uh, uh, colorectal surgeries up to 15% failure rate. Uh, now, again, with this uh, double set tape uh, technology, we can even make it into a duct tape like uh, you know, sealing. Uh, this can be used to seal those uh, uh, surgeries, uh, this anemostic leakage, or to reinforce the uh, surgical uh, the suturing points. Uh, let me summarize this part. I discussed the uh, wide adhesion and the bioadhesive. Uh, the key idea is, remove surface water, so that's number one. Uh, then you need to fo form both very fast physical cross-link and the chemical cross-link, strong chemical cross-link at the interface. Then the third one, tough dissipative matrix. Integrate all three together. Uh, now I think we have a, a good solution for tissue adhesives, potentially replacing sutures. We are working very hard uh, with collaborators towards this goal. And the idea are summarized into this uh, one equation, right? Uh, if you're interested, you can take a look at the details of those papers, right? Uh, now, let me uh, switch to the second fundamental mechanics topic, fatigue, right? The example is uh, uh, fatigue resistant hydrogel devices and uh, coatings, right? Uh, for soft materials we just discussed, we can make it a very tough, even tough adhesion. How about the cyclic loading, right? How about the fatigue behavior? Now, this is the fracture toughness of uh, this hydrogel uh, that uh, we developed, right? Uh, you can see over a thousand joule per meter square due to bulk dissipation. Now, if you subject to this, uh, this uh, material to cyclic loading, exactly the same material, cyclic loading, the fatigue threshold is only on the order of 50 joule per meter square. You can see after a few cycles, uh, this uh, material damage. The reason is cyclic dissipation, uh, cyclic uh, loading, uh, you know, deplete the bulk dissipation of the material. Then you do not have bulk dissipation. You do not have toughening mechanism anymore. Then the material actually are subjected to fatigue fracture, fatigue failure. The pioneer works in this field uh, for rubbers has been done by Lake and Thomas and for hydrogels, Professor Sewell's group in recent years has been done pioneer works in this field indeed. Uh, our contribution in this field is this. Uh, we propose a fatigue resistant strategy 
The idea is here, uh, it's a very challenging to design polymer chains uh, to be uh, anti-fatigue, right? You, you can design very long chains, but the polymer chain can entangle, can have other uh, you know, challenges. Uh, we propose design intrinsic high energy phases in soft material so that the fatigue crack can be pinned by those intrinsic high energy phases, such as nano christening domains, and then they do not uh, propagate over cyclic loading. Here is one example. This is a uh, 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 hydrogel with around 15% crystallinity. The fatigue threshold is already over a thousand joule per meter square. So material level uh, designing strategy. And uh, let me even show you the mechanism of why this uh, nano crystalline domain can give you an uh, intrinsic high energy phase. This is in collaboration with Professor Chen at Syracuse University. Uh, we did this MD simulation. You can see this is the uh, process of uh, pulling one polymer chain from a nano crystalline domain. It's uh, analogous to pulling a long fiber out of a certain matrix, right? The energy is much higher than the energy required to fracture the uh, fiber by the cell, right? You can see here is the results. Uh, orders of magnitude higher energy are required because now you need a break and the reform many, many hydrogen bonds during this pulling out process and the contour is very long, then you have a very high energy. So uh, one uh, candidate for this high, intrinsic high energy phase is nanocrystalline domain. This gives you high uh, fatigue threshold. How about the fatigue resistant uh, uh, adhesion? The key idea is bound the intrinsic high energy phases uh, on the interface, right? Once we know this intrinsic high energy phase, we can bond it in the interface on the interface so that the crack are pinned, interfacial crack are pinned. If the crack want to tilt into the bulk material, it's also pinned, right? Uh, here is uh, uh, one uh, example of a cyclic loading, right? Uh, the state of art, uh, this uh, interfacial fatigue threshold is on the order of 50 joule per meter square with intrinsic high energy phase. Uh, you can easily achieve 8,000 joule per meter square. And it turns out uh, the interface in our human body, especially soft material, hard material interface, are all designed following this strategy. Uh, biology do not use amorphous chain. They are actually using this kind of crystalline domains, nanofibers to form this extreme fatigue resistant adhesion. If you want to know details, you can take a look at this paper. Now, uh, what can be the impact? So what? Uh, now we can achieve fatigue resistant, low friction, anti-falling hydrogel skins on diverse medical devices, all the way from metal, polymers, glass, ceramics. You can see very complicated geometries, uh, inner surface, outer surface. We have a way to coat such a fatigue resistant hydrogel. Uh, this one is just one example, right? Very high force applied on this cartilage, frictioning on this uh, uh, hydrogel coated interface. After uh, thousands of cycles, uh, no observable damage on the cartilage or on the hydrogel surface. You reduce the surface modulus over 100 times, reduce the friction coefficient 10 to 100 times, yeah. dramatic reduction. Uh, and now this is really product level, I would say quality of coatings. Uh, so two examples, one is uh, the hydrogel skin on uh, pacemakers, another is on uh, Folly catheters, so both inner surface and outer surface are folly catheters. Now in collaboration with our uh, uh, clinical uh, collaborators, uh, we are doing preclinical trials on large amount of animal models uh, for this uh, technology. Uh, now, uh, the third, I want to use uh, around 20 minutes to discuss the last fundamental mechanics topic, actuation, right? Uh, the example is ferromagnetic software robots. Uh, to remotely empower doctors, right? So it's highly desirable, especially nowadays uh, in the minimal invasive surgery age, highly desirable to design small robots that can navigate inside the body to do different kinds of uh, treatment. Well, there are many options for the actuation of such uh, robots, right? Light, heat, electricity, you know, pH, uh, different uh, temperature change, we believe magnetic actuation have an advantage over other actuation mechanisms, especially for biomedical application inside the body. Uh, for this long list of regions, you can remotely apply magnetic field. It's untethered. You do not need an electrical wire 
or optical fiber or thermal heating wire or whatsoever. It's a, a untethered magnetic field is safe to the body. It's all also unshielded by a human body. Uh, in addition, there are already existing infrastructures to generate this kind of steady magnetic field for actuation of robots. For example, Steel Texas is one company that are developing this kind of facility. They are already commercially available facility to control such robots. Uh, the contribution of all group in this field is uh, this. Uh, we propose a new strategy to develop those uh, ferromagnetic soft materials or robots. We call it a printing ferromagnetic domains. Uh, the idea is now you can print this uh, soft material matrix together with this uh, called a ferromagnetic or hard magnetic particles together. Then you couple a permanent or electromagnet around the nozzle of this uh, printer. Then as you print this fiber, you can polarize. Basically you can you know, uh, uh, reorient uh, those uh, small ferromagnetic particles. Then the fiber you printed has polarity. Then imagine you can print a 1D fibers, 2D sheets, 3D objects with complicated shape at the same time, complicated ferromagnetic domains. So we call it printing ferromagnetic domains. Now here's one example, right? This is still a single fiber, but we can alternating the ferromagnetic domains on this fiber. Uh, then we apply an external magnetic field. Uh, you can see those domains tend to tilt orange around this uh, magnetic domain, then you deform into this M shape. We also develop a model uh, to guide the design of uh, such uh, soft materials and the robots. Now, I wanna discuss some details about the models. So this is a magneto elasticity, right? Uh, we need a large deformation, so deformation gradient and the, the, uh, uh, there's a Jacobian of a deformation gradient uh, determines the volume change. Uh, then in terms of stress, we have a stress, true stress, nominal stress at the current state, reference state, magnetic field, uh, magnetic flux density, body force, Heimholtz free energy density. So these are the variables, parameters we will use in the formulation. Uh, then in terms of the formulation, it's an equilibrium condition for both the stress and the magnetic field and the magnetic flux. And uh, in terms of uh, work conjugation or constitutive law, it's a work conjugation of the deformation gradient and the nominal stress, uh, magnetic flux and the magnetic field at a, a nom uh, nominal state, right? Uh, the theory in this field has been, you know, long, uh, long, long time ago laid out by Maxwell Cauchy. Uh, recent work, uh, Professor Dorfman Organ really summarized very nice recent works uh, in this field. Uh, the contribution of my group in this field is we propose this ideal hard magnetic soft material model. Uh, the key idea is here. Uh, this is the relation between the magnetic field and the magnetic flux of a typical hard magnetic material. You can see hysteresis loop, very challenging to model. It. However, if your actuation domain is only here at this uh, narrow region, uh, then you can develop very simple models uh, to model this system. Here, basically the relation between the magnetic flux and the magnetic field is linear uh, with a shifting factor. There's a residual magnetic flux due to the printing process. During printing, you print some residual uh, magnetic flux, right? So this is a relation. Then there is only one parameter, this uh, coefficient uh, between the field and the flux. It turns out this coefficient is air permeability. Let me explain it here. Why that uh, coefficient is air permeability? Uh, because the dipoles of this uh, polarized hard magnetic uh, particle, neodymium ion boron, has been saturated, right? Those are already been uh, saturated. Then if you look at the permeability of air is mu zero, uh, this hard magnetic particle is on the order of 1.05 mu zero, close to air. For polymer matrix, also mu zero. Therefore the whole uh, hard magnetic soft material, uh, the permeability is on the order of a mu zero. This has a significant consequence in terms of mechanics and model. Now, if you put this uh, hard magnetic soft material into an uh, applied magnetic field, it will not disturb, uh, disturb or perturb the applied magnetic field, right? Because this has the same permeability as air. So it's, uh, you do not put a foreign material into the uh, system. 
uh, the uh, magnetic flux uh, still see an air permeability. Uh, then you can decouple magnetic field and deformation, right? Uh, you can first calculate magnetic field once, and then you can save is as a uh, you know constant is a constant a field constant. Then you can calculate deformation time and time again. So uh, that's the beauty. With that understanding, uh, we further give this uh, you know free energy function. Uh, for the this uh, hard magnetic soft material in an applied magnetic field, and then you can derive the uh, the uh, the this uh, this is a magnetic stress. This is a magnetic Cauchy stress generated by the magnetic field on this uh, hard magnetic soft material. Right? Uh, with that, uh, we can predict. We can develop a quantitative model for ferromagnetic soft robots. Here is one simple example. This is a beam, right? You actually uh, magnetize it, then you apply an external field. You can see simulation results, experiment results, data, you know, match very well with each other. So now we have a predictive model for soft robots. Many students are interested in the field of soft robots, especially students in mechanics. Uh, one question you should ask, can you develop quantitative predictive model of your soft robots because such model are important for the design and the control of your soft robots. Uh, let me discuss some examples here. Uh, here is one uh, model guided design, right? This is a 2D origami. You can see uh, this uh, shape of this origami and the magnetic field patterns, this uh, uh, ferromagnetic domain patterns are highly complicated, but we can use our model to do multiple uh, uh, iterations of design. Uh, you know, here we can do multiple iterations of design. Eventually, once we fix the design, we only print once, right? This is the experimental results. This is the model results. Uh, 3D, another example, uh, matter material of auxetic structures is uh, quite interesting nowadays. Uh, existing one require compression on the auxetic material to have this uh, negative Boson ratio effect or tension on the material. Now, uh, we don't need, uh, you know, apply a mechanical law. We just apply an external uh, magnetic field, right? Here, you can see, apply external that magnetic field. Then the domains in this uh, outside material will rotate, eventually give this uh, negative Boson ratio effect. Uh, how about a more complicated designs, right? Uh, so we currently even propose an experience-free design approach. Uh, the idea is you can use computer to generate many random configurations towards the property you want. And because you have a model, you can simulate the properties, the you know, uh, functions of this uh, randomly generated configuration. Then you can feed those configurations uh, to a machine learning program uh, algorithm. Uh, for example, here we use generative adversary networks. Uh, this will give you basic high dimensional extrapolation, right? Do an extrapolation, give you even better design eventually the final design is experience free. We don't need a designer's prior experience to design such a, uh, uh, to design such a, a devices or geometry. Uh, for this, it takes much longer computer times than experienced uh, you know, a designer, but it's experience free. Everyone can just use this program code to your, do your own design. You know, let computer run this for a long time. Eventually the computer will give you uh, many, many possible designs. Then we can think even further, right? So in our daily life, we are actually programming 2D ferromagnetic domains to save data on our computer disk, right? The hard drive of our computer. Now with the similar method, uh, we can save data model and the design using this uh, 3D printing method into this uh, uh, 3D software robots, right? So here, for example, here's one design then we just use similar uh, method, save it into this uh, 3D robot. But we have very good control of this robot because we already have uh, very accurate models for this robot. And then after seeing those uh, results, now you can deploy this robots into the field. Right? Uh, here, for example, one uh, function. This robot is a uh, very fast uh, you know, deforming. You can see uh, this is a uh, rolling glass ball. Quickly, you can catch this uh, glass ball. Uh, nature called this a uh, quick change artist because this uh, soft material robot uh, can change its shape within a fraction of a second. Uh, London Science Museum asked a very good question. Could a squeezy robot save lives? This is one impact that we are exploring. 
especially one target is treating acute stroke in the golden hour, right? Uh, this uh, acute, uh, the stroke is uh, number one cause of long-term disability, number four cause of death in US. Every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke. Every four minutes, someone dies of a stroke. Uh, however, uh, stroke, if you treat it in this golden hour, a few hours right after the stroke, it's a reversible. Uh, the technology is called a thrombectomy. Uh, basically, you uh, make a cut at the lab and then insert a guide wire all the way to the uh, brain, uh, to the stroke region, right? Doctors will do this kind of surgery under X-ray, this is a fluoroscope. Uh, there are many intrinsic challenge. Number one challenge, unavailability of doctors, especially rural area. It's impossible to put a highly experienced neurosurgeon in every you know, uh, city or in every small town. That's uh, intrinsically impossible. Second, uh, these are uh, heroic doctors. They actually suffer a lot. They suffered from accumulated radiation from X-ray. For the patient, it's a one time, right? You do CT, you do flower scope. But for the doctors, it's their whole career, right? They see many patients even each day. So this, uh, they worry a lot about this uh, accumulated radiation from X-ray. On the other hand, time loss equal to brain loss, right? There is an intrinsic need for such technology. How to address this uh, challenge? Uh, we propose highly operated, even autonomous robot so that the doctor can operate in another room, even in another city. So in some places, you do not have a neurosurgeon, but neurosurgeon can may even possibly operate it, do the treatment in another city, right? In those medical centers. The key idea is, uh, we designed this uh, 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 magnetic soft robot, especially into this guide wire of thread shape, right? Very, very thin guide wire. Then we program the ferromagnetic domains along this guide wire. Then when you apply external magnetic field, the guide wire bend on demand. And then you have a highly complicated uh, uh, this uh, muscular system inside the brain, but you can use this on demand bending uh, to navigate inside the brain. I will not show too many results, just show you one example, right? So this is a real size uh, cerebral vascular phantom with simulated blood. So friction, all the you know, viscosity, similar to the real brain. Uh, here's our guide wire, right? You can see on-demand bending uh, to avoid all this aneurysm. So you do not attach those aneurysm, very smooth navigation. And here you can determine which branch uh, to go. Here, you can go into the aneurysm. You can go into one branch. You can go to another branch. Just to put this into perspective, these are the reasons we are talking about. You can see highly torturous, uh, you know, blood vessel configuration. The diameter is on the order of five to seven uh, millimeter. You can see this uh, smooth navigation. Very good. Uh, now the previous one is uh, uh, you know uh, tightly operated, so the uh, the doctor possibly operate such operation in another room. Can we have autonomous control, even autonomous navigation of this robot in the body? So uh, our surgeon collaborator told us, uh, "Can you let me drink a cup of coffee? You navigate this guide wire to the key location, then I do the treatment, so that you know I can use my time in the most efficient way." So now we are talking about this problem. It turns out mechanics play a key role, right? Here, first of all, we have this high quality imaging of the blood vessel and the guide wire, right? We know the location of the blood vessel and the guide wire. Uh, then it gives us this model. In this model, basically, uh, the, pro the question is, I know the location of my guide wire. I have a desired trajectory of my gu guide wire. What magnetic field should I apply? to bend my guide wire towards this desired trajectory, right? That's an inverse problem, very challenging, you know, nonlinear problem. However, uh, this uh, machine learning algorithm, especially this uh, deep neural network, uh, designed to solve those kind of problems. Especially if you have a model, your model can feed the network with millions of data. Now we are developing this network uh, based on our model. So we do millions of simulation to feed this network. Uh, then hopefully this network uh, will tell you, here is one possible magnetic field you can apply so that you 
and uh, you'll get one towards the desired trajectory. Then you move forward, then you bend again, do this uh, process in an autonomous manner. Uh, we can even think a little bit further. Right? Uh, nowadays, uh, people are saying AI plus 5G plus robotics will give us a future autonomous cars. Scientists are working very hard towards this goal. Uh, however, there can be societal issues. How about uh, so many Uber and Lyft drivers? They'll be out of job, right? Uh, how about, uh, you know, Dave has a beautiful Ferrari. Do you want to give up the joy of uh, driving? Uh, then how about pedestrian? If this pedestrian were hit by this uh, car, who should be responsible for this accident? The pedestrian, the car owner, the car company, or even the scientists who designed this program for this autonomous car. So there are lo lots of societal issues. On the other hand, uh, we believe AI plus 5G plus robotics will give us a future medicine, especially in minimal invasive surgery domain. Right? Scientists, we are working very hard. We are teaming up with many scientists in different in, in control to solve this uh, challenge. Uh, surgeons, they're actually on board because we are not replacing surgeons. We are enabling surgeons. They can save more lives remotely. They don't need to suffer from this accumulated X-ray and they can be highly efficient, save patients from remote locations. Patients, time loss equal to brain loss. So I think everyone is on board and the technology is also converging towards this breakthrough. So I believe eventually, you know, AI plus 5G plus robotics can potentially give us future medicine. And under the generous support of NSF uh, AFRI, we are actually exploring this vision indeed uh, with a team of collaborators from Harvard Medical School, uh, Philips, you know. Here you can see, this is the robotic arm controlling this magnet. Uh, this is the view under fluoroscope. You can see beautiful navigation of this uh, uh, skywire under the control of uh, external robotic arm applying this uh, magnetic field. And you can also develop this kind of 3D models used for training doctors for future surgeries. So many things are possible. And also the technology all converging towards this point. Uh, I think I will stop here. So I discussed the uh, uh, extreme mechanics of uh, soft materials. I believe fundamental mechanics still play a key role uh, in many modern technology. Uh, in particular, I discuss uh, three uh, topics, adhesion, fatigue, and actuation. For adhesion, especially white adhesion, key mechanism are remove interfacial water, and then you integrate bulk dissipation and the interfacial linkage so that you can form fast, strong biocompatible adhesions, especially for bioadhesives. Uh, for fatigue, fracture intrinsic high energy phases, uh, then you can have extremely fatigue resistant at the same time, soft materials for many applications. For example, uh, coatings of uh, medical devices. Uh, for actuation, we propose ferromagnetic soft materials and uh, robots. We have a very accurate predictive model for soft, such soft materials and the robots for the design and the control. Uh, so you can remember these are three figures and the three equations. Then you, uh, you know, abstract, uh, you, you remember the essential uh, features of my talk. Uh, then in terms of impact, I propose the vision of merging human machine intelligence, many, many possible impact, better health. That's something we all want. Uh, our technology now are making some impact helping doctors and helping patients. Uh, also, we have a very clear idea about the translation of the tissue double set tape and the, this uh, hydrogel coatings for medical devices. So they are in uh, preclinical trials. Understand the brain. Uh, I do not have time to discuss this topic, but uh, you can take a look at this review paper to see the visions we propose for this uh, field. Extend the human capability many possibilities. Here we uh, use an example of extend the doctor, certain neurosurgeon's capability. There can be many other possibilities. And this list actually goes long, but I want to emphasize one key point. Mechanics plays a key role. You can see 
throw those research. It's really the mechanics enable the breakthrough. Mechanics towards collaborations with other experts in other fields enable the breakthrough. Uh, acknowledgement, uh, there's uh, three key students, uh, Hyun Wu uh, leading the bioadhesive and the adhesion project in my group. Uh, Xin Yu Mao also helped the modeling of the tissue double side tape. Uh, Xiao Ting Lin on the fatigue resistant soft material and the fatigue resistant uh, adhesion. Also, Xin Yu Liu and the previous postdoc, Ji Liu, now uh, assistant professor at SASTEC. Uh, you know Kim on the uh, ferromagnetic soft robot part. Uh, now, uh, postdoc Liu Wang is uh, working towards this direction, and the previous postdoc, uh, Rika Zhao, currently uh, assistant professor at Ohio State University. And this uh, group, you can see the background, my background, actually, this is the photo taken at that uh, background. Uh, also, collaborators, uh, research collaborators, uh, uh, I only uh, mentioned the name that I discussed in the talk, Professor Alan Roch on the Heart Patch Project, uh, Professor Sean Chester, on the uh, simulation of a ferromagnetic soft robot, Professor Pradeep Sharma on the development of the ferromagnetic uh, material models, uh, Professor Qin Zhao uh, on the MD simulation. And the clinical collaborators, we really have a dream team of uh, clinicians that are collaborating with us. Uh, Professor Nabsi at the Mayo, Professor Biano at the BWH, Professor Griffiths at the Mayo, Professor King at the MGH, Professor Vevs at uh, uh, Best Israel, uh, Professor Alzaki at the MGH, Professor Aman Patel at the MGH. And the, the, actually, this list goes along too. Uh, it's really uh, it's a truly honor and uh, uh, you know, it's a, a great pleasure to work with this uh, team of uh, uh, clinicians, collaborators. Also, uh, funding resources NSF, uh, MIT Institute of Soldier Nanotechnology, and uh, OER. And uh, thank you very much. I think that my timing is very good. Yeah, the timing is a terrific, wonderful talk. Shanghe, uh, can you unshare your oh, sure. screen so we can bring up uh, sure. the panelists? Sure. So David. Uh... Okay, Shanghe, first of all, let me thank you very much, uh, both for what you said to me and for everybody else. Mm -hmm. I can't see uh, anywhere to... Uh, Usually there's a place to clap, put a cl hand to, uh, clap, but I don't okay. see it on my screens. Yeah, Virtual good. round of applause. <laughs> right. Everybody is clapping, you should. <laughs> so uh, now we have time for questions and um, I'm looking, I think the panelists, if you would raise your hand, uh, we can call on you. I don't see anybody. Does uh, David Bijoni. You have to unmute. Oh. Don't hear you, David. David, we cannot hear you. Oh, dear. Uh -huh. Yeah, turn is ready. Who's so, ready? Uh, can I uh, shoot this? Uh, this uh, uh, I asked a similar question uh, uh, to uh, uh, John Rogers. Um, I'll uh, ask you the similar question, but uh, uh, more specific, since you also worked with the physicians, doctors, uh, medical practitioners, uh, hospitals a lot, extensively. Uh, would you like to share your experience uh, working with them, uh, especially in the early days, we try to uh, initiate the collaboration? Thank you, Turner, for the question. This is a very important question. Uh, so let me rephrase the, the question. The question is, uh, how do we form uh, the collaboration with uh, clinicians, uh, doctors, uh, you know, to explore the impact of our technology? Uh, the, the answer, uh, there are a few key points. Uh, number one is uh, you should have, uh, uh, you know, the right technology can, that can solve the problem, the challenge of uh, clinicians and doctors. So from our experience, they are actually uh, eager, very eager to try. Uh, new technology because they see you know life and death no, on awesome. a daily basis. They want the you know in their yeah. technology. Uh, then the second, actually, uh, before we even uh, initiate some projects, uh, we go talk with doctors. Especially once we form the collaboration, even before we form the collaboration, we go to talk many doctors. Uh, my team frequently interview 
uh, doctors, surgeons, to ask them, what's your challenge? And we have a potential technology. Can that potentially address your challenge? The benefits of such inter uh, interview is really, number one, put your research in perspective. Number two, uh, then later, once you develop the technology, the technology become mature, uh, that the doctor, that the clinician is very likely to become your collaborator. So I would say these two are key. Uh, then uh, number three, uh, you know, uh, once you, uh, you know, develop uh, technologies, you know, uh, then maintain the relation with the doctors. So uh, my group members are doing that also very well. So eventually form a strong collaborations with a team of uh, clinicians. Thank you, uh, uh Tong Ching, you have a question. Oh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, hi, Xuanhe, this is Tong Ching here. Uh, very inspiring talk. So uh, I have a question. That, uh, so in your introduction part, so you mentioned that one of the goal uh, of developing soft materials is to understand human's brain, right? So I'm quite uh, interested at this topic. Uh, I, I have read some of your papers and Zidane's papers, some other papers. So now people are trying to use hydrogel to replace some other material to detect to detect signals uh, of neutrons uh, to transmit signals, something like that. But uh, but I'm quite curious that so can we use some soft materials to to uh, extract the information behind the signals? Is it possible? So I think this is the final goal of the, uh, as you mentioned, to understand human's brain. Right? So I'd like to listen to uh, comments about this. Thank you. Uh, now, Tong Qing's question is uh, about the soft material technology's potential application in understanding the brain. And the uh, specific question is, can we design soft material is, uh, eventually even, you know, can really, uh, you know, detect the information by itself? Uh, there can be many possibilities. Uh, my uh, view of this field is this. Uh, currently, the IC technology or, you know, nano microprocessing technology is so advanced. Uh, we should not to you know, redevelop the system based on soft materials. For example, you do not want to redevelop the uh, you know, uh, sensors, uh, those uh, computer chips for analyzing signals uh, with soft materials. I don't think we have a game to play there. However, this interface between the neural cells and the existing sensors, currently people, the majority of the field are still using metal to sell interaction. And the people already know that's not ideal. It has uh, many drawbacks. Uh, so I believe we can play a key role on the interface. Uh, now, let me give you one example. Elon Musk, uh, you know, there's a neural link, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, release a report. Uh, the report is, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, actually hydrogel based interface electrode, P.PSS has better electrical property than conventional metals on this interface. But due to the reliability issues, uh, eventually they decide still use metal as the electrode uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, this uh, neural lace, they are, they are device to interface with the brain. I believe soft material technology has a great game to play because we are expert in terms of uh, making the material to be conductive on one hand, tough, fatigue resistant, long lasting on the other hand, we can solve the you know, adhesion problem. I believe we have a, a key role to play on the interface. So that's my view. Uh, but uh, there are, of course, there are other you know, opinions. Uh, some groups indeed are designing a full system based on soft materials. It's also possible, but uh, my philosophy is if there is already mature technology, let's harness it. Let's uh, work on the, you know, really the weak, weakest link of the system. Uh, thank you. Uh, Aditi, you have a question. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that was a really great talk, Ashwan. Hey. I have a question about the, uh, the ferromagnetic robot that you were navigating through the blood vessels. So can you comment a little bit about like what the end can do to the aneurysm? Like you can navigate to like certain points, but then what can it do at the end to like, you know, work around? Yeah. 
Yeah, Aditi's uh, question is uh, about the actuation part, especially for this uh, guide wire robot. Once you navigate to the desired location, what can you do? Uh, I didn't show the full picture because this uh, talk is supposed to focus on mechanics. Uh, there are two steps. So the first step is, and the most important step is to navigate uh, the guide wire to the lesion, to the desired location that you want to do treatment. Then the next step, uh, you have a, a catheter. Insert following the path. For that one, you don't need the navigation because it will follow, automatically follow this uh, guide wire, passively follow this guide wire. Insert it to the uh, place, then you can do treatment. So for example, for the aneurysm, you can do coiling. Uh, for a uh, stroke, uh, you can do aspiration or you can deliver drug. You can do different type of uh, treatment. Uh, we actually explore the whole process. We are also uh, you know, in the process of uh, uh, trying to do animal tests with this technology. Uh, but uh, today's talk is uh, focusing on uh, mechanics. So I didn't discuss uh, that part, but a very good question. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so let me just remind people that uh, you can raise your hand and we'll see it uh, if you wanna ask a question. And uh, David, can you get your uh, audio working now? We'd yeah, like to hear I, yours. I think so. Do you hear thank me? Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you, David, for being here. Thank you. First of all, I would like to compliment for the talk. Very inspiring talk. Very nice to, to listen all the stuff you did with soft materials. Compliments. Uh, I have a comment, a very quick comment, that addition with uh, soft and wet materials is very important for testing biological materials because when one has to do a tensile test, it's very important to use the correct glue. That's a comment. But then the question is um, uh, regarding medical phantoms to train doctors. Uh, it's very challenging to use hydrogel elastomer stomer hybrids for this. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, the question, how this material behaves when the medical doctor tries to use a scalpel and to cut it. Is it good? Does it work? The question is about, uh, so uh, uh, it's about the adhesion of uh, hydrogel and the elastomer, two soft materials together. And the specific question is about this uh, medical phantom. Uh, the medical, uh, and the, it's uh, uh, David's question is, uh, when the doctor try to cut it or do practice surgery, does it work? Uh, now, David, let me first tell you, uh, the major application of doctors using that phantom is for imaging. So, nice. uh, you know, to practice imaging. But, but if you go to the website of that company, now they are indeed developing based on this uh, bonding technology that after you image, uh, you can do, uh, you know, practice surgeries, right? You can, you know, do a biopsy, use uh, you know a surgery, or use uh, some tools uh, to cut some uh, thing off. After that, uh, you need to seal the hole using a certain technology. Then the hydrogel will not evaporate; it will not uh, dry up. So it uh, indeed works. I but the majority is uh, majority is uh, for medical imaging, David. I see. Good. But I think that by the way, uh, David, by doctors the way. To, to, to use the scalpel is still very important. It's a very important stuff. So, yeah, thank you. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kant Hui, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Xianghe. Hey, this is Kant from SASTEC. So, a uh, very informative and inspiring talk, as always. So, I have a question about this um, double side tab. So you mentioned to point one is this uh, after swelling, this double side tab will form this um, covalent cross link with the substrate, either the issue or other materials. And another point you mentioned is that this double side tab can adhere different types of adherent except from um, tissues. For example, you mentioned between hydrogels and electromers, between hydrogels and uh, other inorganic materials. So um, I'm wondering if um, for every pair of these um, adherents, you need to um, design a specific chemistry for this double set tab to match the chemistry of the adherent or you have a general solution? Ah, uh, the question is about a wide adhesion, especially this a tissue double set tape part. 
And the specific question is, do we need to change the chemistry of this double side tape for different tissues and for yeah. different devices? Uh, the answer is uh, no. Uh, what we did is we actually make product level quality double side tape and use that. Uh, then for the adhesion to tissues, because there are certain chemical groups that are abandoned throughout the body. For example, amine groups. So you know, almost every organ's tissues in the body contains amine groups abandoned in uh, you know, proteins. We target those chemical groups so that you have a universal strategy for this double side tape to adhere to tissues. Now, to different devices, similarly, we do not modify the double side tape. Instead, what we did is we do simple surface treatment of the device. So eventually, uh, you know, you have your double side because this is really eventually we want to move this to GMP level, uh, you know, manufacturing high quality products. So every group, uh, you know, who wants to try this can try this. Uh, we want to make this to be a uniform form factor, easy to use, easy to ship. Uh, but uh, you do simple treatment of your device and for the body, no need the treatment. Just put it up, it works. Five seconds. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Jimmy, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, Shenghe, beautiful talk, beautiful talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, my understanding of the soft robotics part is you need to know the topography in order to drive this wire to a certain location whether the topography is through imaging or through whatever technique, okay? Uh, but natural systems using, use uh, multiple signals to drive motion, actuation. Chemotaxis is a good example, right? You, you, you follow the chemical uh, gradient in order to go to certain places, or you can follow, for example, heat gradient to seek the location of inflammation. What's your thought about maybe developing it into uh, something that can be locally driven, but also uh, smartly programmed to do that? Not only the actuator part, you can even think about your adhesive. Uh, wound healing is not done by seeing where the wound is is done by seeking or by the uh, blood cells seeking where the wound is. Yeah. Is there some technique uh, that you can develop to do that? Sure. Very good question. So Jimmy's question uh, in uh, regarding the ferromagnetic soft material and uh, this uh, guide robot part is currently we rely on imaging of the blood vessel and the robot to do the control and the navigation. Uh, can we embed sensors on the robot so that the robot can you know, receive other signals, for example, chemical signals to do navigation by itself? Uh, now, Jimmy, let me answer this question from two approaches. Uh, one is from the translational approach, eventually collaboration with the doctors, uh, with the surgeons, and then from the fundamental research approach. In terms of uh, translation, we actually propose ideas, right? Add more sensors into this uh, robot, you know. Uh, it turns out that our collaborator would not prefer that. Make it as simple as possible, as reproducible as possible. Leverage existing imaging capability. You know, you have such advanced CT, fluoroscope, leverage those. And then, uh, you know, focus on the functions that they design. So that's for the, you know, translation for the, uh, you know, application. Now, from fundamental research approach, indeed, uh, one important topic, critical topic in the field of uh, so-called soft robotics is sensing and the self-awareness of uh, the state of uh, the robot, right? Uh, currently you can design you know, pneumatic, different types of software, robot. very beautiful, uh, but uh, what's the strain? What's the stress? What's the deformation? You know, where is the robot? These are still challenging uh, topics. Uh, so in that case, uh, adding sensors, especially the kind of sensors, you know, uh, really are leveraging, harnessing uh, the capability of human body, right? Some chemo you know, go to the desired location. 
uh, those will be very interesting scientific questions. So that's number one. Uh, about the bioadhesive part. So uh, Jimmy's uh, question is, uh, now actually human body has this uh, automatic healing process, right? They can heal. They know where you have a cut, where you have a, a, you know, a injury. Uh, then they actually adhere or seal it automatically, right? Uh, can we leverage some capability there? Uh, I would uh, say uh, on that, actually we are doing in certain sense uh, because you can see we are studying adhesion, wide adhesion, right? That's only the first step, right? We adhere the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, damaged tissue together, or we adhere a drug patch on a tissue or a device on a tissue. That's only the first step. Then the body will kick in, right? They will do those uh, healing process themselves. So we are, uh, in some sense, we are already uh, leveraging this cable. Well, in this process, indeed, uh, you can, for example, uh, use some growth factors in our adhesive. Uh, use some, uh, you know, chemo uh, uh, you know, signals to accelerate this healing process to mitigate foreign body response. Those are actually uh, not only scientifically important, also practically important. We are exploring that with collaborators now. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Li Ching, you have a question. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Pooja. Your talk is very uh, interesting. So I have a small question. Maybe it's not related to the your main project in your talk. So I noticed that in your simulation of the peeling test, uh, there is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, I noticed that, you know, either in your um, uh, experiment, uh, experiment test or your simulation, we, there is a kind of a spacing phenomenon. So it's all the last last week's talk uh, by given by uh, Han Xingsa. So they also mentioned that kind of uh, you know spacing deformation. There is also a spacing deformation. So I'm wondering what kind of uh, factor could control this phenomena in your test, or do you have some suggestion? Uh, or, very good yes, question. I, I love this. This is a mechanics question. Yeah. So the question is uh, when we do this appealing task, right? Yeah. Yeah. Both the experiments and the simulation, you see those undulations. Those undulations are called a fingering instability. And the data has a length scale, right? Wavelengths, right? Then uh, mm -hmm. what it determines this wavelengths? Yeah. This is a very interesting question. Uh, so uh, simple, short answer. Uh, the thickness of the film you put in between determines this length scale because that thickness is the only length scale in that problem. Now we also study other, uh, you know, instability problem. Actually, Xiao Tinglin, who is in the audience, uh, he is the expert. He actually lead all the projects in my group in that direction. Uh, we also observe some called a fringe instability. Uh, for that instability, there is another less scale. Take a look at the papers. You can search fingering and the fringe instability in my group website. You will find but the fingering instability I showed today. Uh, the thickness the thickness of that uh, soft material layer determines that length scale. So it's, sorry, it's like the um, the one uh, proposed by Prof. Um, Gao, Gao Huajian and uh, um, Bai and uh, Poland, that paper, right? They mentioned that this kind of spacing is related to the thickness. But from my test, I'm also wondering there are also some other factors could also control this spacing length. Uh, that's why I mentioned that there, if uh, you form other type of instability, for example, mm -hmm. fringe instability, uh, then uh, it's not a thickness anymore. It's a sample size. If you shrink the sample to be very small size, you will see something similar, but it's a different type of instability. Uh, then the uh, radius of this uh, uh, sample will, uh, you know, uh, determine the line scale. We can uh, chat more after, you know, offline. This is a very interesting mechanics problem. Thank you very much. Uh, going on the fringe instability. Thank you, Xuanhe. Jian Su, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Xuanhe uh, Zhao. It was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm Jian Su Kim. I'm working with uh, Professor Ji Yang Su in Harvard University. I have uh, three questions, uh, two simple specific questions and one general question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the first question is about swelling on bioadhesive. Uh, it was dry adhesive and it goes into the body, which is full of biofluid. 
So how this swelling affects the function or property of the bioadhesive or regeneration of the cells? And the second question is about um, PVA um, hydrogel, uh, fatigue resistance hydrogel. There were a lot of nanocrystals um, around the matrix. And uh, I, uh, you said that the crack propagation was pinned in the nanocrystal. But I was, I was confused because the crack will find the weakest path along the crack tip. Why that crack tip should be, a, should be um, pinned in the high energy density area. The last question is more general um, for the actuator. A magnetic source is really um, uni, um, versatile. But I, in, in, on the other hand, the energy conversion ratio efficiency of the actuation seems quite low be because we have to uh, irradiate or make a field into entire area or volume space. Uh, what kind of energy source would be promising for a high energy conversion ratio for soft actuators? Thank you so much. Thank you, Johnson. Uh, three very good questions. Uh, actually on three topics. Uh, the first one is on this uh, tissue double set tape especially this uh, dry adhesion mechanism, because we need to use this double set tap first to absorb the interfacial water. And uh, Johnson's question is, what's that uh, you know, absorption uh, you know, effect on the biocompatibility, on the cell viability uh, in human tissues? Uh, so first of all, if you uh, take a look at the uh, calculation we, I showed, in order to absorb certain amount of uh, uh, interfacial water layer, right? uh, the thickness of this t uh, double side tape is very thin. So on the order of uh, 10 to 50. So the amount of uh, interfacial water or the amount of body fluid you absorb is really minimal. Then uh, we did in co collaboration with Professor Bobby Padara at uh, uh, Harvard Medical School, we did a very careful histology test of this uh, uh, you know, tissue double side tape embedded on different location of uh, this uh, animal model. Uh, we show the biocompatibility of this uh, dry double side tape after absorbing body fluid is uh, on the same level as FDA approved tissue adhesives, core soil or other tissue adhesives. So that also validate the biocompatibility of this uh, mechanism because you only absorb minimal amount of uh, body fluid. Now, the second uh, question is on mechanics. Very good question is about the fatigue resistant soft materials. Uh, we propose that nanocrystalline domain can pin fatigue crack so that you need a, you know, very high energy to fracture those uh, crystalline domain to uh, advance your fatigue crack. But uh, Johnson's question is, uh, it's hard to imagine it can really pin the, uh, the fatigue, uh, the, the nanocrystalline domain can pin the fatigue crack because the crack will seek the weakest part uh, to propagate uh, inside the soft material matrix. The answer is you are correct. Yes, that's true. However, when you increase the density of your nanocrystalline domain into certain threshold, above certain threshold, then it's uh, like percolated. No matter where this, and imagine this is a 3D matrix, right? It's everywhere. No matter where this uh, crack propagate, you will always see some nanocrystalline domains. And then we will try to damage them. They become nanofibrils. Uh, they uh, you know, further pin this uh, crack tape. So uh, take a look at our paper. When the density of nanocrystalline domain is very low, such as 1%, you do not significantly enhance the fatigue threshold. Uh, so does it contradictory to the elasticity of this PVA gel? Because we need, um, we need some area, certain volume, which yes. is not crystal yes. to be elastic. So yes. it seems contradictory to- so, uh, Johnson's question is, when you increase the crystallinity to too high, you may sacrifice the, uh, you know, uh, the softness. The, you may increase the modulus, indeed, but you can find a balance point. Uh, in see. the PAS paper, we propose even another strategy. You use nanofibers instead of nanocrystalline domains, still quite intrinsic high energy, uh, but uh, that can give you soft, both soft and fatigue resistant. So uh, once you have this idea, intrinsic high energy phases, then you can you know, design different materials.
to satisfy your application. Now, the last one on ferromagnetic soft materials, uh, in terms of the actuation, uh, Johnson's question is, what's the energy conversion efficiency? Uh, the answer is, is very low, but, but, it really depends on application. You know, if efficiency is really about uh, you know uh, concerning application. For this medical application, I have a whole setup. There's a hospitals. You know, I really do not care the energy wasted in this process too much, right? Uh, it's uh, different from the scenario. You know, a car on the road or some other application. It's really application specific. So that I think uh, for biomedical applications. Or application of this, uh, you know, robot in a confined space, magnetic actuation has uh, its advantage. Uh, currently, in the field of uh, so-called artificial muscle or soft material, people always want to propose one material that is, uh, you know, overall excellent. I don't think that's a good strategy. It's really application driven. Uh, ask what a function you want to achieve, then you uh, can uh, design your material, you know, to have high efficiency in some applications. Uh, in other applications, you know, tether free, accurate modeling, uh, reliability, safety, uh, for example, biomedical applications, these are more important. So, uh, you know, I hope I answer your questions. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So, I uh, just want to say that uh, some people, the, some of the attendees are putting their hands up and we will get to them if they stay there, uh, if, you're, if you're willing to wait. Uh, next person uh, is Jason. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Jason Steck. I am a oh, first. Thank you, uh, Shanha, for the great talk. And um, I am a PhD student in Jigong Suo's group. It just finished my second year. And I had a question regarding the designing the extreme properties of soft materials. And, um, and then relating to the machine learning section in um, uh, section three regarding actuators. So uh, me coming into this field, I see, say, uh, when we began designing soft materials with extreme properties, we would target, say, one property. Oh, how do I design a very tough soft material? And I can modulate the uh, chemistry or other uh, morphology of the material to achieve that. However, um, as we continue to do this and then begin to add other properties to the mix, um, we still haven't quite gotten to the point where these materials are used commonplace in industry because they often require a, a, a diverse array of properties. So um, do you see machine learning emerging as a way to uh, optimize a combination of innumerable properties for a material um, to then optimize for an application that a company would be able to uh, design like that? Anyway, yeah. Uh, Jason, uh, good question. Uh, let me answer uh, both. Let, let me answer the two parts of your question. So Jason's uh, question is, uh, number one, uh, you know, as we work in this uh, field, uh, designing more and more uh, these uh, soft materials, now we are uh, facing the challenge that, uh, you know, uh, in realistic application in industry, sometimes it requires a number of properties in combination. Uh, to satisfy a uh, certain uh, requirement of uh, realistic applications, right? Uh, how do we design that? And then the second question is, uh, can uh, you know machine learning help that? Uh, let me first answer your first question and then answer the second part. Uh, the first one, I believe it's possible. For example, uh, uh, we are very confident that uh, uh, you know the bioadhesive double set tape and the, the uh, you know, fatigue resistant or robust coating already satisfy a uh, majority of the requirements, at least uh, from our collaborators. Uh, and uh, we believe you know, similarly you know, uh, in the field of uh, let's say interfacing with the brain uh, in other fields, uh, there will be emerging soft material technology eventually go directly towards re uh, application, towards societal impact. I, I believe that's uh, possible. And uh, the reason is we design them based on principles, right? We design them based on mechanism, not a mysterious uh, material. We design them based on principle. Then you can implement multiple principles for different uh, you know, properties in the same material system. So once you understand the fundamental mechanism, mechanics and physics, I believe that's design is uh, possible. So that's number one. Number two, 
uh, will uh, machine learning or this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, algorithm computer can solve this problem? Uh, well, that's, uh, I may have found many people in the machine learning field. Uh, my answer is no. It's uh, machine learning, at least uh, from my experience, from my experience, uh, machine learning is an extremely powerful tool for either interpolation or extrapolation in multi-dimensional domain. But the key is not machine learning, it's data. How do you obtain large amount of data to enable you to do such exper, uh, interpolation or extrapolation? And in order to get those data, you still need to understand the basic mechanism to develop models. So you still need this whole process. Uh, but uh, what is a machine learning good at? So from all, uh, the paper I discussed today, it's really, uh, you know, can free up your mind. You don't need to constantly think about this design. Uh, you know, computer can, you know, gen randomly generate many things and then automatically pass to machine learning program uh, to do extrapolation. So it can facilitate, but it will not solve the problem by itself. You need a large amount of high quality data. Sometimes data by itself already solve the problem, but uh, uh, you know, at least you need a high quality, large amount of data uh, as the foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, next is uh, Zheng Jia from Zhejiang University. It's late for you. Sorry for not getting you earlier. No problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So thanks for the great talk. This is Zheng from an assistant professor from Zhejiang University. So I have two questions. Uh, first, so you mentioned this spelled adhesive that can form very strong adhesion uh, with the animal organs within seconds. So my question is, is this adhesion reversible or detachable? So can we detach it uh, from the organ after we use it? Then the second, my second question is also about the machine learning part. So uh, because there are a lot of machine learning algorithm out there. So my question is, uh, how can we, uh, so how do we choose uh, a specific machine learning algorithm to design a, let's say a soft material or soft machine? So you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the two types of machine learning algorithm. One is JAN, the other one is uh, recurrent machine learn, uh, recurrent neural network. So why do you uh, use those two in your research? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Very good. This is uh, Zheng, uh, uh, Professor uh, Turn Li's student, now rising star at Zhejiang University. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, now, uh, let me answer the first question. Can I share my screen? I think with a slide, I can you know, answer it uh, better. Can I share my screen? Sure. Sure. Okay. So uh, now, after we uh, published this paper, I received this question a lot. In every, uh, almost every talk I give, uh, uh, people ask this question. Now, let's take a look at the fundamentals. Uh, this is the process, right? Integrating strong interfacial adhesion and the bulk dissipation in this process. This process do not intrinsic prevent you to make it to be reversible. For example, those are strong linkage, you can make them to be reversible. Here is uh, one uh, example. Uh, right? So let's say uh, I make a cut, make an incision, right? And then I want to seal this uh, cut, right? This is a, a ex vivo a test. This is a pig lung ex vivo test, right? Yes. Uh, I want to use this tape to seal this, uh, but uh, uh, I misplaced it for some reason. I misplaced it, right? Uh, then obviously uh, this is not an ideal scenario, right? You seal one part, the other part is uh, still uh, leaking. Uh, then you can use, because this mechanism does not prevent you to make it reversible. You can chop off those covalent bonds, right? Uh, spray some very biocompatible uh, solution, easily peel it off, right? You peel it off. Then the next step, you have a, a more accurate, better seal. And uh, uh, this is really product level, uh, you know, uh, right, you see it. So this is the uh, first, uh, uh, this is the answer to our, uh, the, the general uh, solution is this. 
design your material system based on mechanism instead of specific material, then you have lots of flexibility, freedom in the later part of the design. Now, the second question is about uh, what a machine learning program to choose. Uh, let me answer it in this way. First, ask the question, do you really need a machine, machine learning program to, for your problem? So first ask yourself, do I have a large amount of high quality data to feed to the machine learning program? Once you say I have either from my model or large scale experiments, I collect such an amount of data, I need something to analyze them. Uh, then in the second step, uh, actually we tried a few. We tried, uh, you know, for example, for this uh, general adversary uh, you know, network, it's, uh, uh, it's naturally fit this problem. We want to design some new geometry, right? We feed it with many data. So this uh, general adversarial uh, network, generative uh, adversarial network, really just drawing those uh, new configurations for us. So that's a naturally fit this problem. Uh, then for the second one, similarly, we want to solve this inverse problem. That's a tool suitable for the inverse problem. Uh, so I don't think this will be a challenge for anyone who want to join this field. Uh, you first ask yourself, do you have a large amount of data? Do you have a problem? Really need that. I know this is a hard topic. That's why I throw it in this uh, today's talk. But uh, uh, I do not want to convey the message. Machine learning can solve all problems. Uh, I don't believe so. We need a large amount of data uh, to you know, take advantage of those uh, algorithms. OK, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, James, you're next. If you can unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I'm very appreciative that Professor Joe that you give us a wonderful speech, and uh, really appreciative. For. Um, though my major is not a medical area, but uh, there is some connection between uh, the common science. You know, I just come from. Uh, I'm PhD from NUST, Nanjing University Science and Technology. I've got several basic questions and uh, I'm very thank you that uh, if you can uh, if you can give me some suggestion and uh, the first one is that uh, what is the general idea of studying a scientific problem as you understand and uh, which several main aspects should we start and how can we find the innovation finally the important thing is that to uh, writing the paper, <laughs> though it is very basic questions, but I still have some problems on it. Thank you. Uh, this should be a question actually for Dave and the Jigan. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're the uh, the the person who's become the real expert. The way you publish and the beautiful work you do, I think you've learned both how to do it and you've learned how to do it. So you're the uh, best teacher the there short, is. The short question is: I, I, just, learned from, uh, I really want to hear your suggestion. Yeah, I learned from uh, mentors like uh, Jigang, uh, Dave, and uh, other, you know, pioneers in the field. Uh, now, uh, so again, uh, I'll just uh, discuss some of my personal experience uh, when uh, Thank you. Uh, I like a scientific problem. Uh, there is, a, a, I think I learned this from uh, George Whiteside, uh, you know, professor at Harvard, this uh, pasture quadrant. So uh, you, once you see a problem, you always ask, uh, is there a societal need or is there a fundamental? Uh, if it satisfies one criterion, that's a problem you can work on. If it satisfies two, uh, then this can be a, a great opportunity. Uh, but if uh, it satisfies neither, uh, then probably you shouldn't work on such a problem. So uh, then, then is, I think for any scientific problem, you first ask, uh, what is new? Can I make a unique contribution in this uh, scientific field? Uh, then you what ask, uh, so what? Who cares, uh, right? Can I make an impact on the society or uh, make a beneficial impact on other people? So I think that's uh, the thumb of rule. So it's uh, probably the philosophy of uh, many uh, you know, pioneers, mentors in the field. Uh, in terms of uh, writing a paper, uh, 
So uh, that's a, a, a interesting no, question. Well, uh, let me <laughs> yeah. share the experience of writing papers in my group. Uh, I usually ask a student uh, to draft the title uh, abstract very carefully, and then I iterate that with the students multiple times. Uh, then based on the abstract, the student expand each sentence of the abstract into paragraphs of the paper. They already know what is the logic, what is the core message yes. they want to convey in each paragraph. Uh, then you go to the uh, you know, uh, paragraphs uh, to connect the paragraph with the figures. I think that's probably a good way so that your paper is coherent, is logic. You have a storyline in the paper. Just my experience, yeah. Really, thank you. You know that a lot of, yeah, a lot of Chinese students, you know, especially PhD, though he do the results, but he cannot write the whole articles. You know, it's very hard for most of the PhD in China. I think getting the results probably is even more important. Yes, not saying really writing paper you. is not important, but getting the results probably more important. Okay, really, thank you very much. Very good. So if I could just comment, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much. I uh, also agree that uh, listening to George for uh, learning how to do things is a very good thing to do. And um, I would say that uh, lots, of, uh, lots of students, not only in China, can't write good papers. I think it's a talent that we all have to learn. And so thank you for teaching your students. Uh, Jian Yu, you have a question. OK, thank you. So I'm Jian Yu Li. Now I'm assistant professor at McGill University. And thank you, Xian He, for another wonderful talk. I have followed very closely on all your work. Uh, I have a two questions. The first one is pretty technical. So regarding the tissue adhesive, right? Uh, I think the recent work from Zhigong and from Michael, we show this kind of tough uh, adhesion strategy has kind of like low fatigue threshold. Uh, indeed, you show that based on the PVA, you can have a higher fatigue threshold, but the processing condition is not really good for the tissue. I just wonder in terms of the fatigue uh, resistance uh, tissue adhesive, any comment and idea on that? That's my first one. And the second question is about more translational. I, I think it, it seems to me you are very also a kind of linked toward the directions. In terms of those double side tape, right? Clearly, there's a lot of potential. But from the application point of view and from the FDA regulation, I think probably you need to identify like one or two killer application, and which can really kind of enter the market and has kind of better chance to success. Uh, on that, I just wonder which area or which indication of those application you think and you are pursuing to translation. Very good. Uh, good question. So, uh, Jay, uh, this is. Uh, Harvard alum, uh, rising star at uh, McGill University. Uh, no, the two questions, the one is about uh, uh, fatigue resistant uh, soft material. And uh, uh, Jenny's uh, question, uh, by the way, uh, Jenny also showed that uh, for tough hydrogel, uh, when you have adhesion, uh, the, uh, this uh, fatigue threshold of such adhesion is extremely low on the order of a 50 joule per meter. I should have mentioned that in the top. Sorry, Jay, I didn't mention that. Uh, but the question is, uh, once you use that to adhere to tissues, right? Uh, though such a crystalline domains is challenging to form on your adhesive and the tissue interface. Uh, how can we solve that uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in a realistic applications for bioadhesives? Uh, the answer is uh, this challenge has not been solved. Okay. This is an opportunity actually for the whole field. Uh, you know, now uh, we have, but, but, but now we need to think whether we really need a, such a, a fatigue resistant a, a tissue adhesive. That's the first question because, uh, you know, uh, even the current tough adhesive can already maintain drug patch, can seal those, uh, you know, wound for a long term, eventually all the way towards healing. Uh, we really need to ask whether we need. I think we do need, for example, for tendon, for cartilage repair, probably we need fatigue resistant adhesion in vivo, you know, in real time. That's an open question for the whole field. Uh, I would believe the mechanism is uh, high energy phases on the interface. How to implement that? That's a challenge for the whole field. 
So number one, I do not have a perfect answer, but I do believe the mechanism. Uh, and by the way, this is the mechanism used by nature. If you look at the tendon on bone, cartilage on bone, uh, ligament on bone, they all use this mechanism. High energy crystalline domains or nanofibrils, they all use this mechanism. So that's number one. Uh, number two, in terms of uh, translation, tissue double-sided tape, uh, what do I think is the most close, uh, you know, uh, clinical application for translation in the FDA pipeline? Uh, we have a very clear one, an uh, anasmotic leakage. Uh, basically, the leakage of the GI tract uh, after surgery. Currently, you know, uh, thousands of people die due to that uh, each year. And uh, currently, uh, millions of people are undergoing such a procedure, such surgery each year. There is a strong need, huge market, uh, potentially huge impact, and then there is a technical barrier. So really, uh, you know, uh, there is no uh, you know, ideal candidate. We believe we can make a, a you know, unique contribution in terms of translation towards that direction. Uh, we are proceeding uh, towards that. Uh, there are many other possibilities. So this is a really a widely open field uh, in terms of uh, both fundamental research and the applications. There are many other uh, you know, possibilities. I hope I answer your questions. Thank you, Xuan uh, uh, Ben, you have a question. Yes, um, thanks for the opportunity, by the way. These webinars are really good. I've been just following them and they are great speakers, including today. Um, what I have here, I just have one question. First of all, I'm Ben uh, Sadri. I'm grandchildren of George Whitesides. I'm working oh. with Dr. Martinez at Purdue. Um, so I have one question and the question is about um, the second topic. It was double-sided tape. And um, particularly I'm interested to know, is it possible to make it in an injectable form uh, these double-sided tape, trying to make sure they will be less invasive if that's possible? That's my uh, question. And what kind of mechanics you are going to consider if you want to make it injectable, these kind of double-sided tape? Uh, thank you very much. So Ben's uh, question is, uh, can we make, so it's on the wide adhesion part. And the specific question is, currently we propose this double-sided tape form factor can we make it uh, injectable? Uh, the answer is yes. We are actually, uh, you know, uh, publishing that uh, work as well. Uh, you know, in, in the in, uh, doctors, surgeons we interview, majority of them prefer a tape form factor, easy to handle because injection, you know, uh, you know, you have leakage, other consideration that you should consider. But there are a few scenarios, people indeed, clinicians indeed prefer a uh, injectable form factor. Uh, then uh, it's uh, really the rheology, right? Instead of a solid film, uh, you need to have, uh, you know, fluid-like, uh, you know, uh, uh, material. So you need to consider the rheology. At the same time, uh, with this rheology, you need to implement those fundamental principles, right? Treating surface water. Uh, the second one is top matrix. The third one is integration of the bulk uh, dissipation and the interfacial linkage. You need to satisfy three uh, fundamental criteria, uh, but uh, in a liquid form factor. Uh, uh, that's possible. I can tell you that's possible. And uh, we are publishing that very soon. Thank you. Uh, Nima, did you have a question? Very quick one. Hi, uh, Quick question. Is the adhesion problem temperature dependent? Uh, or it's, so it's just, what's the range you think? Yeah, the question is about the uh, temperature dependence of this uh, adhesion of uh, soft materials. Uh, if you are thinking about uh, soft and biological materials, uh, usually we test them or we explore them at a, a, you know, body temperature or room temperature, you know, 20 degrees C to uh, 37 degrees C uh, for coatings of the medical devices, uh, we actually tested at an extreme temperature. You can heat it up to 100 uh, you know, uh, or you know, 150 degrees C, or you can freeze it. Uh, so for that coating uh, is, is fine. But uh, for the uh, majority of the bioadhesive, we explored body temperature. We have not explored uh, you know, other temperature range. Perfect. Xing Chang, do you have a question? Yes. Thanks, hey. Dave. <laughs> 
Thank you, Xuanhe. Uh, uh, it's really a eye-opening talk, especially when the talk was started. It's early morning in San Diego. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you. yeah, the, the question is, I really kind of enjoyed this envision and the big picture in most of Xuanhe's talk. I uh, really enjoy that part. But my question is uh, pretty, uh, is detail, is about details, two technical details. One is uh, this uh, dry, this double-sided tape. So uh, the tape can absorb the water and uh, form the adhesion. So uh, I'm not sure if I misunderstood or not. So you see there's a hydration layer and uh, it seems there is a sharp boundary between the hydrated layer and the dry part. And uh, um, the hydrated layer travels, uh, the speed is not constant because it follows this uh, square root time. So why is that? Is a diffusion uh, problem? Why there is a sharp boundary between the uh, wet part and the and the dry part? So uh, the this uh, the question is on the tissue double side tape part. It's a technical right. question about this uh, hydration kinetics, right? So right. since the tape initially is in a dry form, they absorb water, then they first hydrate and then swell. Uh, Sheng Qiang's question, why that hydration kinetics follow square root P? Well, that problem actually has been studied uh, you know, decades ago in the community of uh, uh, polymers. Uh, so it's called a uh, uh, case, uh, let, me, let me share my screen. So uh, I have a slide just, just for that question. Very good question. So it's an important question as well. Let me show you this. So, very, oh, here, 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 here. So uh, uh, this is uh, so-called case one hydration. So basically uh, this uh, hydration front, the speed scale with a square root T, uh, it can be case two, uh, then this hydration front scale linearly with uh, T, it can be abnormal, this factor will be something in between. This has been uh, widely uh, studied. Uh, so one uh, governing factor, right? Uh, determines whether this is a, a square root or it's a linear is a polymer's property whether you know what's uh, you know wh whether you you have this uh, uh, diffusion like hydration process or other uh, you know like hydration process it turns out this hydration process is a diffusion like so even though you know it's a hydration but it's still uh, the molecule is a uh, diffusing in this uh, po uh, this uh, polymer matrix and then after it diffuses in, the matrix relaxation is much faster than the uh, uh, diffusion. So it's still diffusion driven. Uh, it turns out for this problem, you can use two diffusion uh, you know, equation to solve it. Uh, if you read uh, the GMPS paper in details, we actually eventually use two diffusion equations. So this is diffusion like hydration. The key physics is the relaxation of polymer chains is uh, much faster than the diffusion in the dry part. In that sense, you have, and then we really, uh, you can see, this is experiment data. This is a theory, beautifully square root scaling. So, and then from this, we obtain the hydration parameter here. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, widely studied in terms of organic solvent, uh, you know, diffusing into uh, polymers. For uh, hydrogels, for water diffusing into polymers, actually uh, not a very well studied. In drug delivery community, there are some study, but I do think there is an opportunity in this field. Coupled hydration and the swelling is a, is a, is a still an interesting problem in the field, I believe. Uh, thank you. Xuanhe, another uh, uh, question um, is about the uh, fingering instability. Uh, so because of the fingering instability, uh, uh, you show this uh, very complex uh, crack front uh, oh no, there is uh, some qualitative understanding why toughens happened, but is there any study showing the influence of this uh, complex deformation near the crack front, uh, the effect of it on the fracture toughness of it, purely from mechanics aspects? So we know uh, the, you have uh, people study the crack blunting, etc. That is all simplified model. So in, in your case, you show this very complicated wavy uh, crack front. 
is there any uh, 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 effects of this uh, profile of crack front on the fracture process? Uh, the answer is uh, yes or no. So for example, Professor uh, Kraton Constantino at uh, ESPCI uh, study you know, heavily this uh, thickness of uh, adhesives. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you know, when you try to peel a soft adhesive from a substrate, eventually it form those long fibrils. Those mm -hmm. long fibrils anchored on the substrate to enhance the you know, adhesion strength and the energy of the system. Uh, however, uh, this uh, finger instability is enhancement, right? How do you design this uh, wavelength? Uh, how do you uh, design, you know, partial detachment of this finger? I'm not aware of, especially in the uh, community of hydrogels. I'm not aware of uh, such uh, studies. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for uh, joining the talk so early. Sure, no problem at all. Yeah. Thank you, Hussein. You have a question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Zhao, uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a question concerning the magnetic elastomer material. Uh, did you observe any uh, hysteresis in mechanical properties? Good question. The question is about the hard magnetic soft material. The question yes. is, did we uh, observe hysteresis in terms of mechanical properties? stress yes. curve. Uh, the question is, this material is different from dielectric elastomers. Many of us who work on dielectric elastomers know the VHP, right? A large hysteresis in stress strain. This material is very elastic. So very small, uh, almost negligible hysteresis. So uh, between the stress strain curve. Now that's one hysteresis. Another possible hysteresis is this magnetic hysteresis, right? If you apply your magnetic field too high, let's say to the order of one Tesla above the coercity of uh, your hard magnetic material, then you observe a magnetic hysteresis. But uh, in our application, we constrain the applied magnetic field to the domain of 100 milli Tesla. So we do not observe this uh, uh, magnetic hysteresis either. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zheng Zhen. Yeah. Thank you, Xuhao, for your great talk. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm Zheng Jin from Xi'an Jiatong University. Uh, I'm an associate professor uh, in mechanics. Uh, I have uh, a question about uh, your double-sided tape, because uh, it's just a single layer of hydrogel or just the, uh, it's deposited on a, a soft film, because as I know, it's a, uh, for many uh, totally dry hydrogel, it's kind of very stiff and fragile. But in your case, it's kind of as it's, it's kind of soft. It's just because it's partially dry, or other reason. Yeah, uh, good question. So Zheng Jin is a rising star uh, in uh, Xi'an Jiao Tong uh, University. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question is about the bioadhesive part, especially about the uh, double side tape. Uh, the question is: uh, Is the tape in partially dry state or fully dry state? Uh, the answer is is in fully dry state. And it's indeed in a glassy state so that its modulus is quite high, but thickness is very thin, right? So Professor Rogers discussed the principle of flexible electronics, right? You make it a yeah. thin uh, so that, you know, it can be flexible. Uh, similarly, uh, because the thickness is a very thin on the order of a 10 to 50 micrometer. So the tape is very easy to handle. And then during application, it, uh, almost instantaneously hydrated, then it become very soft. So it doesn't really constrain to, you know, uh, due to its uh, high rigidity. So it's different from a bulk dry glassy polymer. It's a very, very thin field. I got it, thank you, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Uh, Deepak, you're next. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Deepak, a, a final year PhD student from National University of Singapore. So thank you very much for an amazing talk. I really enjoyed it. So I have two questions. So first thing is uh, actually uh, in my PhD, I have been working on designing auxetic materials using isogeometric analysis and shape and topology optimization. So uh, first thing is I was trying to optimize for targeted poison ratio and stress strain properties so that I can match 
for human skin and cat skin which we published earlier so i want to know like if, can you please uh, like uh, elaborate a bit more on like what are the properties and applications you are looking at for oxidic materials because you briefly highlighted about oxidic materials and uh, uh, my second question is you also mentioned about like using machine learning gans or rnns to optimize so i have been ex like my research was mainly focused on shape and topology optimization but ex i explored a bit of like standard optimization toolboxes like genetic algorithm surrogate optimization so how do you compare machine learning in uh, with these techniques where do they fit thank you very much good questions uh, so there are two questions uh, number one is on the uh, magnetic oxidic uh, structure so why do we design that uh, we designed that actually inspired by pioneer works in, uh, including uh, professor uh, bigney's uh, work and uh, you know other pioneers work you know on oxidic structures right uh, so that's uh, something uh, quite important uh, especially in uh, nowadays in you know aerospace in biomedical applications right uh, when we designed that we actually didn't think of uh, application per se we just posed this challenge can we design a structure that uh, you know without a contact uh, you know you apply a field so it give you oxidic behavior uh, then the principle design principle is you need a rotation of segments in your uh, materials you know uh, you need a rotation of uh, certain uh, you know components uh, then it turns out this uh, uh, rotation of magnetic domains in an applied magnetic field is uh, so natural very easy to achieve so eventually we go to that step. Uh, in terms of application, uh, it's possibly for certain you know, uh, drug delivery system in the biomedical application, we have not explored that. Uh, but uh, uh, there are other uh, you know, uh, researchers, this is a very dynamic field, uh, potentially will uh, you know, explore that. Now, uh, your second question, uh, comparison between topological uh, optimization and the machine learning algorithm for designing of uh, structures and uh, materials and devices. Uh, we actually have first hand experience. First of all, in terms of efficiency, topological optimization is uh, way better, much better than this machine learning approach. Machine learning is really a brutal force. You randomly calculate many, many data. You feed it to an algorithm. Then you uh, possibly, you can generate a you know, global like view but uh, the efficiency is very low. You need a long time uh, computational power. Uh, but uh, one advantage is, especially in the paper we published, we got uh, you know, hundreds of designs, especially for uh, this uh, uh, HS bond of uh, pores uh, material. We got uh, hundreds of uh, 2D designs. Uh, that's a uh, very challenging for uh, topological op optimization to achieve. I would say each method has its own uh, you know advantage and the machine learning or this uh, you know uh, experience free design approach is really at a very beginning stage uh, whether it will be successful uh, competitive uh, in comparison with technological optimization uh, we do not know uh, one advantage of machine learning uh, uh, approach is we don't need experience for even for uh, technological uh, optimization you need a designer's experience. You need some initial gas. You need some engineering tuition. Uh, machine learning is brutal force. You let uh, the computer to do all those jobs. So uh, I, I have to say they have their pros and cons. Uh, uh, TO is already very successful for many problems. It's a prone uh, success. Uh, this uh, a new approach we propose, we are not sure, but uh, uh, we are delighted to explore it uh, with the community. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Shuang Hei. Uh, uh, Ji Wei, you have a question. Yeah, yeah um, Ji Wei, a uh, visiting PhD student from Wisnet, and I appreciate your wonderful talk. A uh, uh, similar and quick question. Uh, in your talk, you said uh, we can train the machine learning just with simulation. So I wonder how to prove the, the simulation correct without experimental data. Yeah, it's a some job I, I do it here. Very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, go back to the philosophy of this uh, uh, you know machine learning design, right? Uh, in our design, uh, we use uh, all use simulation data 
to train the, uh, this uh, uh, neural network and then to extrapolate uh, hopefully better designs. Uh, but uh, GUA's question is, how can you validate, uh, you know, the data is uh, valid? How can you validate your simulation data is uh, correct? Uh, yeah. The answer is for certain problems. So uh, I showed many validation of this uh, model then you can have a certain level of confidence of your model. Then based on that, uh, you, do, uh, you use your uh, machine learning program to analyze your simulation data. And not only that, after this, uh, you know, we propose those designs, we also use experiments to validate uh, the you know, designs proposed by the system, by the machine learning algorithm. So it's now that you know you got it and then you trust it. You validate it again. Uh, the beauty of this uh, mechanism or this method is the whole process is uh, experience or intuition free, right? Uh, eventually, mm -hmm. you use computer to randomly generate a certain geometry following some rule. Machine learning do uh, extrapolation without uh, your you know interference or experience. Then the, you got some experience of free results. But uh, you can see at the very beginning, we have a validation. Uh, after we got the results, we have another validation. Machine learning is not magic. You need uh, you know, correct data. If the data you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? If the data is wrong, then you do not have a, you know, a good results, correct result. So you put uh, input uh, you know, correct data in, you validate those data. For your output results, you also validate that. Thank you. Thank you, Yan Fei. This is a very great talk. So uh, uh, congratulations. Um, I just uh, uh, want to. Uh, I'm just uh, curious. Uh, I mean, you, Jigan, and many other people have been. Uh, I mean, uh, trying to make a very tough, very tough uh, materials. So um, uh, on the other hand, uh, for the hard materials. Uh, many people are working on metals, or ceramics. Uh, they can be really hard, really tough. So, is there any way that we can, uh, I mean, cross over those two uh, disciplines, uh, making some hybrid, even hybrid, uh, the tough ceramics with your tough, soft materials? Just a curiosity. Uh, uh, Yan Fei is actually a uh, Zhigang student. Uh, you know, my my, my senior. Uh, Yan Fei uh, studied uh, hard materials. Uh, metals, uh, ceramics uh, with Zhigan. And uh, Yan Fei's question is, uh, uh, can we you know, do some synergy about the toughening of fatigue resistance of uh, uh, soft materials together with hard materials? Uh, well, I would just say the mechanism, the fundamental mechanism are the same, right? So for example, for toughening, uh, you need the ductility, you need a uh, uh, dissipation. Uh, these are the same for metals, for ceramics, uh, for soft materials, for gels, for elastomers, it's the same. And then for fatigue resistance, uh, it's uh, similarly uh, in metals you have, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, some uh, nanoparticles, some other, you know, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, inclusion to enhance the fatigue uh, resistance of the, uh, you know, of the material. Uh, I would say uh, one synergy probably is on this uh, fundamental principle level, mechanism level. Uh, you know, we can learn from each field. Uh, then, in terms of uh, uh, whether we, uh, in, in terms of a material question, uh, whether we need to design such a hybrid material, that depends on applications, right? Uh, if you have an application, a true need that you want to design such a hybrid, robust material, uh, then why not? Uh, one application we see and that we believe there is a potential strong societal impact is uh, medical equipment and the devices. Many of them, the structure must be metals, right? To maintain long-term uh, rigidity, long-term robustness. For example, artificial uh, uh, cartilage joint. Soft materials, especially this, uh, you know, fatigue resistant coating can potentially to provide, uh, you know, uh, low friction, you know, highly robust coating. So there can be opportunities. Uh, that is, a, uh, you know, uh, application driven. Principle uh, is a uh, lot of synergies. Principle, I would say, even similar, maybe even the same application. Uh, then you can find hybrid materials. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, uh, very nice. Thank you. 
Cheng Huang. Hey, David, thank you. Cheng He, uh, enjoy your talk. This is Cheng Huang Ling calling from Silicon Valley. Uh, hey. I have a, actually a very practical question uh, related to the application of the system and device uh, you are working on. Particularly, you emphasize on the opportunity at the interface between the electronics and the uh, human body, particularly in the uh, understanding brains. Uh, my understanding is that uh, for these uh, type of uh, device to work, uh, the device first need to go through uh, a very stringent sterilization. And uh, with these uh, soft uh, materials, what's your thought on how to uh, make these implementable, implantable devices uh, withstand the stringent uh, sterilization process? Ah, good question. So this is uh, about the translation. Uh, it's a general question for actually all the uh, materials that I discussed. Uh, sterilization. Before you can apply your device or your equipment uh, in the body, you need a uh, you know, harsh environment for sterilization. Uh, the technology actually I introduced all three of them. There's a double-sided tape, coatings of medical device, and this uh, uh, robot. You can sterilize them in dry state with no problem. Uh, because the mechanism uh, enable you to design those materials is a fundamental mechanics. It doesn't care whether it's a dry or it's uh, you know white. Uh, you know you can design your material uh, to be sterilizable. So currently, uh, before the uh, uh, in vivo uh, you know experiments, we actually sterilize them either use high temperature or use other you know method to sterilize it. Uh, is so we use them begin with a dry state, then you uh, you know hydrate it with the body fluid or use other fluid to hydrate it. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Li Hua, you have a question. Uh, yes, uh, Xuan He, yeah, in this talk, you mainly talk about uh, application of soft material in human machine interface. So do you see any other opportunities of applications of soft material other than this field? The question is a more general question. It's uh, uh, with uh, soft material, are there other applications of uh, soft material? beyond human machine interface, I would say there are, uh, you know, broadly uh, impacts or applications. For example, uh, uh, Professor Waits study colloids, you know, uh, milk, uh, many, uh, you know, suspensions, many industrial applications rely on such materials. Uh, microfluidic systems, uh, you know, uh, many, I would say many, many other applications, food industry, you know, uh, chemical engineering. Uh, this is uh, really a booming field. I see many, many opportunities, uh, you know, uh, with uh, soft materials. We do need uh, more fundamental studies. You know, pioneers like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Flory, uh, Degenes, uh, you know, they lay the foundation, especially uh, based on entropy theory. They lay the foundation of this field. But uh, there are many other, you know, uh, fundamental topics that uh, we can study as a, a discipline. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think uh, we're getting to the end. I don't see any other questions. Um, I, as host, have the, the right to ask you the last one. Oh, sure. Uh, but before I do that, let me say, uh, first of all, that uh, thank you very much for your talk. I think it was thank absolutely you. at the same standards of all the ones that we've had. So I congratulate you and uh, I thank uh, Zhigong and all his gang for organizing these. It's uh, Somebody says it's the thing you look forward to all week. It is indeed. Um, so I have one last question and then we can uh, finish it. It was really a fabulous discussion. My question is this. So I sort of have this intuition about elastic properties of soft materials. I understand them. I understand what sets the, 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 the bound. I understand the fundamental origin of an elastic property. You guys talk about toughness. Can you give me some intuition? Can you tell me what the fundamental limitation is for a certain material? Can you tell me how I can think about toughness sort of in the same way that I can think about elasticity where I understand that perfectly? I just don't understand toughness in the same way. Can you give me some physical intuition about the fundamental limitations? This is a great question. So Dave's question is, 
uh, difference between elasticity and the toughness of soft materials, intuitive, uh, uh, intuitive understanding of uh, the difference. Elasticity of a soft material polymer networks depends on entropy, right? Entropy of the system. Toughness actually is energetic concept. It's really entropy does not play too much role. It's when you try to you know, stretch all the way straighten the polymer chain and then fracture the polymer chain, what energy required for that process. So I would say fundamental understanding uh, elasticity is that it's a floppy state. Entrop entropic uh, uh, elasticity play a key role. Fracture is when you straighten the polymer chain, the energy required to fracture the chain. That's uh, well, I, I'm going to push back on you and tell you that um, I think of um, um, elasticity. Yes, it's entropy. You can say, OK, it's KT. But you know, elasticity varies by 12, 14 orders of magnitude. Yeah. Energy, bond energies vary from KT to 40 KT to 100 KT, 100 orders of magnitude. It's not the energy. The energy is a minor component. It's the density. It's the energy density. That's where the big yeah. thing comes from. Yeah, yeah. So to me, elasticity is really how, how many, what the density of the bonds that are creating elasticity. So I want to know, I, I, tell, I say that uh, toughness, you want me to just think, well, it goes from KT to a covalent bond, so it's a factor of 40, and then I take that and I multiply it by the elastic constant, that's the toughness. Is that the way I should think of it? Uh, or is there some more fundamental thing that, in, 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 that, that lets me think about it in a more uh, general way? No, Dave. Uh, no, I, I think I understand your question uh, better. This is really for general materials, not only uh, polymers or not only uh, polymer network. Elasticity is about uh, deforming covalent bonds or deforming the bonds. Uh, fracture toughness is about uh, failing that bond, what energy uh, it requires. So is that a two, you know, uh, if, if you think about the elasticity of the material, right, you are distorting that bond, but uh, to not to an uh, extreme extent. Fracture is really extreme extent. You are breaking those bonds one by one or in a certain way. Uh, okay, but you know, deforming and breaking, there's probably not that much of a difference. And then it seems to me what's really coming in is uh, is the amount you can deform it, right? The, yes. the yield, the yield strain. Yes. And so I say, well, for almost all materials, almost all, yield strain is between one and ten percent. For really tough materials, really, really stiff materials, it's less. For really soft materials, it's more. But is that all I have to know? I have to think, well, oh, just how much can I stretch something? And then it's roughly going to be the elasticity times that, because elasticity, you know, it's the bond energy. And so whether, whether it's, uh, you know, they yield the bond or anything. Jigan, you're going to you're, you're gonna save me from myself. <laughs> so you kind of appreciate, this is the kind of conversation I have with uh, Dave. Dave cannot take crap or even good answer. He has to turn into his own way. Right? They're all good physicists, all good engineers like that. So I guess they, uh, so toughness, uh, there is, of course, a street people thinking and also an engineering measurement. The measurement we're talking about that can be quantified really is uh, energy needed to advance a crack by unit area. It has a joule per meter squared. When you advance a crack, the most basic requirement is you break one layer bond. That's one layer bond of energy. But it's an irreversible process. You may cause energy dissipation way into the bulk. So toughness, if you wish, is infinite. For example, water has the highest toughness because you cannot even drive a crack through water. I know how to drive a crack through water. So toughness is infinite. No, no, oh. you put it, in, put it in a gel, right? <laughs> then, then you're basically breaking water. If you break gel, you're basically breaking water. So okay, you, but I, I got it. You're telling me that toughness has units of tension. And so tension is like a surface energy. Yeah. And so I have to just calculate the number of surface bonds and that gives me some estimate. And then maybe I have to add some energy in the bulk. Yes, yes. Often the energy in the bulk is many orders magnitude higher. In particular, energy in the bulk can be infinite. It can scale with the volume of the bulk. 
So that do, do I do I somehow figure out how far into the material a deformation will travel? Is that the way to think yes. about it? Yeah. yeah. Essentially, right. you're uh, asking your uh, the very simple question now. Return. So energy dissipation is about a hysteresis, right? Loading up, loading down, dissipate energy. But a dissipation requires you load up to certain stress level. So the stress comes from a crack tip or how high the stress you need to break the bond. If that stress can travel into long distance, you have enormous toughness. That's how all these uh, advances, metals, ceramics can become tough. You just recruit lots of atoms off crack plane to participate in the game. Like a zoom would do. Okay, so um, uh, unfortunately for me, uh, th that doesn't give me a very general thing. I have to think about it for each material, but maybe that's the only answer you can give. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to think about it. I'm going to think about it and come back to you. With the... This is the best kind of host they want to have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so let me thank everybody who's still attending. Uh, it's uh, wonderful. We, we had, uh, I saw at least 750 people who attended. Uh, so uh, you've done a great job. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to everybody. And thanks to Zhigong and company. Really, this has been wonderful. And so thanks a lot. And until next week, Thank next you, Wednesday, David. I think it's uh, um, Katya, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank, thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, Shantra. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. So EML webinar will be every week. Please help us uh, to to promote the meeting, sending sure. our link to people. And in particular, next week is a great Katya Batodi. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Xiangke. Yeah, wonderful. Fantastic talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Xiangke, bye-bye. Bye-bye.